A little song I wrote, you might want to sing it note for note. Don't worry, be happy. In every life, we have some trouble, but when you worry, you make it double. Don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy now.
got no place to lay your head. Somebody came and took your bed. Don't worry, be happy. The landlord say your rent is late. He may have to litigate. Don't worry, be happy. Look at me, I'm happy. Ooh, give you my phone number. When you worry, call me. I think you have it. Don't worry. Be happy. Ain't got no cash. Ain't got no style. Ain't got no gal to make you smile. But don't worry. Be happy. When you worry, your face will frown, and that will bring everybody down. So don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy now. Don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy, don't worry, be happy. Now there is this song I wrote. I hope you learned it note for note like good little children. Don't worry, be happy. So listen to what I say, in your life expect some trouble. When you worry, you make it double. But don't worry. Be happy. Be happy now. Ooh, 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 ooh. Don't worry. Ooh, 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 ooh. Be happy. Ooh, 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 ooh. Don't worry. Be happy. Ooh, 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 ooh. Don't worry. Be happy. Don't worry, be happy. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't do it. Be happy. Put a smile on your face. Don't bring everybody down like this. Don't worry. It will soon pass, whatever it is. Don't worry, be happy.
Don't wish it away. Don't look at it like it's forever. Between you and me, I could honestly say the things can only get better. Like the wind through my tree, she rides the night 
next to me. She leads me to moonlight, only to burn me with the sun. She's taking my heart, but she doesn't know what she's done. Feel the breath in my face, her body close to me. Can't look in her eyes. She's out of my league. Just a fool to believe I have anything she needs. She's like the wind. Can't look in her eyes. She's out of my league. Just a fool to believe I am anything she needs. She's like the wind.
juvenile scam Never was a quitter, tasting like a raindrop She's got the look And she goes Thank you. 
Blames the one before And all of their frustrations Come beating on your door I know that I'm a prisoner to all my father household dear I know that I'm a hostage to all his hopes and fears I just wish I could have told him I'm afraid that's all we've got. You say you just don't see no. it. You say Hello, good morning. Good morning, how are you? Everything. Are we going live in two minutes? No, no, it's just oh. here. <laughs> Actually, we're going live on uh, at 10. I just put here. Let me adjust the lighting. One See you. 
how things are going in your area, Sarah? It's the storm too bad? No, it's actually fine. Yeah. It's just windy and yeah, it, ha it hasn't stopped raining since uh, last night. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think it was like five in the morning, something like that it was raining, pouring very badly. Yeah, they, they, they even sent the tornado alert. Oh, I haven't received that. Yeah, I saw it at 6 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I was like too tired to even bother, you know, taking any precaution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's still passing. Let me check on the, the app. I think still they said that around 12 to 2 p.m. is going to get the highest wind here. Oh, the highest. Okay. Oh, no, it's passing right now. Uh, it's still in the in the Gulf, so mm. when it's still in the ocean, uh, oh. doesn't have a lot of um, wind, but yeah. when hit the ground, it will start to increase the mm. the wind. Yeah, but I think it'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah, it's not too bad. I saw there are a lot of people on vacation. I hope they are on the East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. I like your background. Like it? Them, right? Yeah, it's the Ben Hill Stadium. <laughs> added a picture of me in the stadium so. <laughs> oh cool very nice <laughs> i like i like diane's background i think i will change i'll have to hers oh, good yeah, it's really cool. but your background is better than all here oh. because it's like oh. <laughs> it's very very well set looking great yeah. I, I actually like organized this shelf like two minutes before coming out, so I promise it wasn't like that. <laughs> I have like my green screen. If I put <laughs> if I put out the green screen, you're gonna see the mask behind. <laughs> yeah, thank God for green screen then. <laughs> yeah, green screen and the the blur on the zoom background. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Those say you can be anywhere. <laughs> this is today's just a pilot to see if it's gonna work so you are oh, the, whole, the whole the whole seminar is a pilot it's a pilot <laughs> okay so if I'm it were the lab rat uh, sort of it <laughs> you signed the irb of the biomaterials lab so we're good <laughs> you're safe So I'm pilot. You see that yesterday that when we we're having our beating, the yeah. computer crashed. So yeah, I hope I it. No, no, no. I'm yeah. I'm glad it did so yesterday, so that today we're fine. Yeah. So yeah, I. It has to crash sometime, you know. So it's it's better that it did that yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah.
by the way, Dr. Ocha, I have a question. <clears throat> yes. Um, when I want to share the screen and I want to put it uh, on presentation mode, so can I can I do it like before I share the screen? Because like I don't want to be exposing like part of the slides before. Uh, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like, so can I? Because when I put it in presentation mode, I can't um, like go back to the to the Zoom so that I can put share screen. You know, I should put share screen first and then put the presentation mode. Yes. So is there a way that I can, you know, like prepare the presentation mode before sharing the screen? Is that possible? Uh, we can try right now. What I can try to do is you just put on presentation mode and then I will give you an invitation to share the screen. Oh, we have our guest speaker. <laughs> Let me see. Okay, so okay. hello, everybody. Hello, Chris. How are you? Very good. And yourself? Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you guys are all on so we can test uh, some of the technical uh, aspects. aspects. Yeah, we're, we're just testing this right now. Uh, Perfect. So, yeah, Sarah, so I think you're going to have to disclose a little bit of the slides, but if you go real quick, That's it's fine. okay. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. yeah. Let me put Chris as co-host as well. Yeah. So then I should be able to share my, my yeah. presentation from my laptop, right? Yeah. And also because you are north north of us, it's just passing a hurricane right now here. So if we lose oh, wow. connection, you're going to be the host because <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. everyone else. Oh, Frank Franklin's here I as well. You. Hey, Hi. Franklin, how's it going? Good morning, good, and you? Very good, because Sarah, Diane, they're helping, Sarah's presenting, Diane is helping with the administration stuff, so we are all in Gainesville <laughs> and under the storm, but that's fine. Let me put my face, yeah. Too bad, so it should be fine. But that's good. Yeah. Very nice. So if you want to test your slides, feel free to do it. Dr. Signoretti, Mario is joining us as well. He's connecting the audio. Cool. <clears throat> I was telling Sarah, this is a pilot. <laughs> <laughs> Franklin, Chris, and Diane, and me together, we have the, the fathers of pilot. We do pilot for everything. <laughs> That's right. I don't ever do a project without doing pilot testing. <laughs> <laughs> So we are piloting this as well. Wow. I like your mic almost like a yeah? studio. <laughs> I'm trying to bring a well, this was a gift from Diane. So she, she gave me a mic so I could work uh, more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's that's good. Very nice. So when do you guys expect the hurricane to hit um, down south? So now it's past, it's still on the Gulf. Uh, is in the, yeah. is in between Sarasota, Tampa, that area. And yeah. it's expect to hit ground probably today at 2 p.m. Nearby. <laughs> it's a tropical <laughs> storm. So it went up oh, to hurricane, storm. yeah, went up to hurricane okay. Caraguay 1. And then now it's down to tropical storm. But all precaution is good. So in the lab, I have to remember it's Elsa is the older sister, the younger one. Oh, the sister. I don't know. <laughs> Diane, Diane might know what well, Elsa is the, is the oldest sister, isn't it? Oh, yeah. She oh, was the one yeah. And Anna is the youngest. And Elsa had anger issues. So it makes sense to hit him the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everything is prepared, so uh, I just said the lab. I said, well, what can happen here badly is like having uh, power problems like in the electricity. So I shut down everything and flood. I'm in the ninth floor, so <laughs> I'm expect that <laughs> if I flood. Yeah, I hope my friends in the, the ground floor doesn't doesn't have any problems. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. 
That's good. Uh -huh. Sarah, you want to test your slides? Just share real quick so we can see how it's working. So I can test. No push. And then I'll ask Chris as well to do it. Mm -hmm. I did. Okay, got it. Oh, uh -huh. Look at that. <laughs> You're good. You know, I had to put it. I had to put her somewhere. You know. Ah, uh, that was a surprise that I just. Okay, yeah. you're good. You can remove it. A surprise. That was good. It sounds like yeah. again, okay? <laughs> That's nice. Very nice. Is gonna put Anna now, this the youngest <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anna with the curing light. The curing light. <laughs> so you can just assign, uh, you know, uh, screen sharing privileges, I guess. Okay. Let me see here. I thought so I, I to yeah, click, click share to see if you can share the screen. Uh, Let's just see. I put uh, you as a Dr. Susie. Morning. Morning. How are you? Good. Very not. Very good. Did this the weather? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. did, did the the, the, sure. the weather just stop with your golf practice plan? Actually, no. I'm I'm in Houston at this time. Oh, you're in Houston. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. How things are in Houston? Very nice. We've been swimming here as well. Okay. <laughs> yeah, in case I don't see the option. In you my don't see for sharing. Oh, oh yeah. I, okay. Let got me it. Just, I see it now. It's now green. Let me just uh, do a little little check here. Make sure that works all well. And you guys should probably see something coming up there. Cool. Very nice. Let me just test looks one good. thing here to, for the YouTube people. Yeah, there looks great. I think. All right, perfect. Cool. Okay, stop share. All right, yeah, perfect. Very nice. So people are joining. So I think I have here the Japanese letters. I think is Mikeen. If I'm not wrong. Marcel. Marcel is our artist. He just graduated uh, 2020. He's like, you have to see his artwork. Good to have you here, Marcel. Dr. O'Neill, Eldre. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Morning. Morning, Dr. O'Neill. Morning, morning. Morning, doctor. Thank you morning. for coming in. Yeah, thank you, doctor. Thank you. <laughs> Looking forward. Very nice. Yeah, I was right. It's Mike. And Hi, good, good to see you. Good to see you, Mike. <laughs> How are you? Very good. I like your background. <laughs> Thank you. What is that? Is a section and cross section of a center yeah, incisor? Yeah, yes, yes. Using the the I, I forgot the polarized polar polar oh. polarized filter. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> cool. Yep. Japanese Japanese teeth. Japanese. I don't know which one. It's the the insert anterior anterior mm -hmm. it's Japanese Japanese. Maybe 16, six, number 16, right? Okay. Yeah. Very nice. Let me. I'll give more to like three more minutes for the people to join in and then I will start this. Sounds good. Good morning, Renata. 
Welcome. So just to give a heads up for uh, Chris and the people who are joining, uh, Renata and Eldre, he they just joined our program in operative and static dentistry. So Renata is all is already here in Gainesville uh, with the storm, and Eldre is still uh, figuring out some things regarding his traveling here. So probably in the future, you guys are gonna see them presenting here as well. And of course, good morning, Mateus. Good morning, Doctor Lee. The boss is here. Good morning. <laughs> Very nice. Without the tie on a rainy day. <laughs> You're good. I'm pretty sure that's not because you don't have a tie. <laughs> All right, so everyone ready? So let's get started. So first of all, thank you so much. Chris, Sarah, and all people there are here together. This initiative is sort of to bring together people who are starting the research and starting their career and people who are in business for a long time and share, has a lot of expertise to share and try to connect this together. So what I expect from this seminars is having a very casual place where we can share the, our experience, but respectful to try to push everyone forward to try to motivate and try to progress. So, uh, I'm very happy with everyone's presence today. So today we're gonna have two guests here. Uh, first, we're gonna have a presentation from Sarah. Uh, Sarah is, she, she just graduated in our grad operative uh, program, the internship. And she did a, a very, very nice job uh, trying to identify the degree of conversion of dental cements and preheated composite. That's a very, very, hot topic now and then i remember sarah i met her was november uh last year and then she dr rosha i want to study preheated composite this is a trend and all that okay uh, i have a lot of controversial things to say about that but you want to do let's do it and then she just performed amazing as as you can see um uh, in her work that she's going to present and also my friend here, Chris Felix. Uh, Chris Felix is a very, very good partner. Uh, he's like a genius. He's in his team. Franklin's here as well. They are amazing. Uh, Franklin, uh, I met him when I when I went to Nova Scotia to 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 go ahead and visit the Blue Analytics, and then he just showed me like probably three, four Arduinos doing crazy stuff, and I said, "Oh, this guy is great." And Chris. Since 2015, I believe, or a little bit earlier, Dr. Farrah can introduce us, and then you helped a lot in all the publications that I, I, Diana and I, we've done. Uh, you have a great contribution on that, so thank you so much. So without further ado, I will pass uh, to Sarah so she can present. She's gonna introduce more about herself, and then after that, we're gonna have some questions and answers. Feel free to send the answers on chat or on the YouTube channel if you're uh, on the YouTube, and then we're gonna answer those questions by the end of each session. And in the end, we're gonna have a conversation and discussion, so let's have fun. Okay, Sarah, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rocha, so much for this incredible introduction. And I'm extremely honored and humbled to be upon the first guest speakers in the Dental Biomaterial Lecture Seminar Series held in the University of Florida. And um, let me share the screen. And before sharing the screen, I would like to congratulate you actually on being the center of uh, the head of the Center of Biomaterial in uh, the University of Florida. And thank you, Dr. Relay, for um, being the past uh, head of the center. So let me um, share the screen now. <laughs> okay, you're probably wondering why is Elsa on the screen, and if you have kids, you probably know who's Elsa, but it's because we're passing through a tropical storm named Elsa right now as we speak, and um, it's not so bad, it's just a lot of rain and wind for now, 
So I hope everyone is staying safe. Whoever is in Florida, take care. Okay. So um, the topic is degree of conversion of preheated composite light and dual cured resin cement containing alternative photo initiators. Um, now the the title might be daunting, might seem daunting, but I promise I'll try to simplify as much as possible and speak in simple terms. So. A little bit about myself, I come from uh, Damascus, the capital of Syria, and then I've been uh, raised in Dubai, uh, a city in the United Arab Emirates, I think most of you are familiar of. And I've, did, I've earned the bachelor's in dental surgery from University of Sharjah, which is somewhere here. <laughs> it's in Sharjah, United Arab Emirates, and then did a clinical training in uh, University of Sharjah Dental Hospital. This is the mobile dental clinic that we used to have. And then I moved to uh, Florida to join uh, UF's um, Advanced Education and Operative and Aesthetic Dentistry. This is the uh, Hill Griffin Stadium that Dr. Ocha has the uh, background set as. <laughs> so the table of content, I'll be introducing the subject, talking about the objectives, hypotheses, materials and methods, result in discussion, and finally, conclusion. So let's talk about um, the dental ceramics we have. Just to revise the type of ceramics, we had non-silica-based ceramics and silica-based, also known as glass ceramics. So example of non-silica-based ceramic would include alumina and zirconia, while the silica-based, which is the glass ceramic, we have uh, lucite reinforced, feldspathic porcelain, lithium disilicate, uh, reinforced glass ceramic. I'll be focusing on lithium dislocate because it's the ceramic of choice in our research. It could be either computer aided designed uh, and milled or pressed. So, okay, in order to achieve adequate cementation, we have a lot of uh, uh, important factors that we need to pay close attention to. And upon these factors that I'll be highlighting on uh, in my uh, research is the looting agent of choice uh, and its properties, the light curing unit that uh, we have to uh, polymerize, and the uh, thickness of the indirect restoration uh, we are yet to cement. So the type of uh, um, looting agents we have are either resin-based cements, preheated composites, and resin-modified glass uh, ionomer cement. And as we know, we don't use uh, RMGIC to uh, cement glass ceramics, so I'm not going to talk about it. So resin-based cements are further subdivided into light cure, dual cure, and self cure. So light cure is a single component material that fully depends on light for it to uh, start the polymerization reaction. Some of the examples in, in the market include Verilink Aesthetic, uh, which is by Ivo Clarva Vedent, and 3M uh, Rely X Veneer. While the dual cure, as the name suggests, it has two component material that depends on two mechanisms for it to start the polymerization reaction. It's the self-cure and the light cure. So uh, once the two components are mixed, the self-curing process begins, and then further exposure to light would actually accelerate the uh, polymerization reaction. So examples in the market would include Verilink Aesthetic DC and 3M uh, 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 3M, um, Relay X Unison, sorry, because 3M has everything in Relay X, so <laughs> it gets confusing. Uh, the self cure is also two component uh, uh, material that once are mixed, takes about like 100 seconds for it to start the polymerization reaction, and it does not depend on light, and light does not affect the, the polymerization reaction whatsoever. So self-cure uh, products are actually like dying out of the market. So we're going to talk about preheated composite, because as Dr. Rocha said, I was um, trying to push preheated composites in the research because I'm seeing a general trend towards uh, using it to uh, uh, cement indirect restoration. So I, I wanted to test it out. So we have um, 
two types. It's either we can use the compules or using the gun and centrally through the uh, lid of the uh, resin warmer. And uh, the research suggests that it uh, decreases the viscosity and uh, will have better handling of the uh, cement and a better uh, marginal adaptation, as they say, uh, and a better color stability. But of course, further studies are uh, encouraged uh, to prove all of this. And uh, the temperature range in which they recommend is uh, between 67 and 69 degrees Celsius. So the light care units, just to talk briefly about uh, the huge development that uh, we have seen in life care units history. Um, back in 1970, the first one was UV, but it was uh, discontinued because of uh, safety concerns, of course. And then we had quartz tungsten halogen, plasma arc, argon laser. Plasma arc and argon laser did enjoy some success in the past two decades, but uh, it, all of them had uh, major drawbacks of being too bulky, being heavy, uh, having uh, the light, uh, very short, short bulk lifespan, and um, uh, what else? Yeah, basically, it's the the heaviness, bulkiness, and they were discontinued to using the uh, light uh, emitting diode, light curing units. So we, we have also seen some um, uh, major developments in the lead light carrying units. So for example, in the design, uh, it was first used as like a gun shaped, but then they further developed it into having uh, a slim pen shaped design just to, uh, to ease the usage. And uh, the major technological issue they faced uh, in lead light carrying units um, is, um, fitting the multiple lead chips into one unit, but this was um, solved by using smaller chips, but much more powerful uh, blue light emitting chips. And of course, uh, uh, Mr. Felix would uh, have all the right information about light curing units. So, so uh, the further development of uh, light curing units uh, introduced the concept of broader uh, spectrum, uh, which is having more than uh, uh, one chip, which is almost four chips, that emits light in different wavelengths. So as we can see, if we project light coming out from a single peak, which is also known as the monowave, we can see only one color being projected, while for the multi-peak, we can see uh, three other colors. So um, what's the implication of having a broader uh, spectrum? So this would lead me to introduce uh, photo initiators. So um, different resin-based materials have different photo initiators. So we can think of it as being the lock and different spectrum being different keys. So we need different keys to open up different locks. So what is the uh, uh, importance of photo initiators? Photo initiators are um, once they are activated with the right spectrum, they would uh, initiate free radicals, which will uh, uh, activate the polymerization reaction. So they are key factor in, um, in curing. So as we can see, violet uh, uh, frequency, uh, royal blue and blue, royal blue is somewhere between the violet spectrum and the blue spectrum. So, um, okay, just a second. Okay, so the violet and royal blue and blue, the violet uh, uh, blue uh, violet spectrum would uh, activate the phosphine oxide, which is uh, the TPO, which would activate the TPO. Royal blue uh, uh, would activate the iviserine. The blue light would activate the camphorquinone slash amine, uh, which I believe most of us are familiar with. Uh, it's used in almost all composites. But the, the, the drawback of uh, camphor quinone uh, slash amine is the yellowing effect that is seen. So uh, that's why they, they came up with alternative photo initiators such as TPO and Ivacerine to be more aesthetic. Okay, sorry. So we have a lot of important factors to look at uh, uh, that will influence the polymerization reaction. But the key factor that I would like to highlight on is the spectral power. Um, since 
radi radiance is also important energy is the quantity of energy is important but having the light being produced in the right spectrum uh, uh, to initiate the polymerization reaction upon activate activation of the photo initiator is very important and it will be uh, stressed on in this research so the research questions will include um, does the thickness of the film dislocate ceramic influence the light transmission of single peak uh, and multi-peak lead lcus what is and what is the effect of the lithium dislocate thickness and the lcu type on the degree of conversion of preheated composite light cure dual cure cement so the objectives include includes uh, the evaluation of the light transmission of single peak and multi-peak lead lcus through lithium dislocate ceramic with different thicknesses and to analyze the degree uh, of polymerization of different resin based lutein agents against the different lithium di uh, dislocate ceramic thicknesses using the uh, two different types of lead lcus so the hypothesis, the null hypothesis would be that there is no difference on light transmittance of single peak and multi-peak, and there is uh, uh, no difference in the degree of polymerization between different resin-based uh, materials cured using the two uh, types of lead LCUs. So the materials and methods uh, used, the ceramic uh, specimen preparation, we, uh, we had Emacs MTA2 CAD block from Ibaclar Vivident that was sectioned, uh, mounted and sectioned uh, using the Isomet 1000 precision saw into 30 uh, rectangles, 12 by 14, each uh, of different thickness. We have we had six different thicknesses, uh, 0 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5 and 3. The uh, light curing units we had was the Smart, uh, Smart Light Pro Polycure and Cure uh, uh, unit. This is by Densify Serona, new uh, uh, light cure unit. Uh, the Polycure emits violet light of spectrum of uh, 380 to 420, and the Cure uh, emits violet and blue. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Polycure emits uh, violet and blue. Uh, the cure emits only blue of uh, 420 to 495. So the light transmittance through the ceramic. So we got the light cure units, which are the uh, in our research, they are the polycure and the cure, um, projecting the light through the ceramic and then onto the sensor of the mark light collector. And we had the baseline was uh, projecting the light without ceramic at first and then uh, uh, with using the ceramic of different thicknesses and we did it uh, three times for each. So the degree for, uh, of conversion we had the light cure unit again the, po uh, the polycure and the cure. Um, the ceramic this the Mylar strip as separating medium between the ceramic and the cement the experimental cement we are using and onto the sensor of the um, FTIR, which is the Fourier Transformed uh, Infrared uh, Spectroscopy. It's such a long name, but I managed to memorize it. Okay, so um, also we had we tried the baseline uh, with no ceramic at first, only the cement. Uh, one time cured with 10 seconds, other time uh, cured for 40 seconds, and 10 seconds per manufacturer's instructions. And then uh, we did the same with uh, each ceramic thickness, and we did that uh, five times each. So uh, the resin-based materials we used were the Light Cure Verlink Aesthetic LC, Dual Cure Verlink Aesthetic DC, and Preheated Composite, we used the Tetric Prime. This is the composition, manufacture, and the initiator system. So as we can see for uh, the very link aesthetic LC, we had ivocerine and TPO. For the dual cure, we had ivocerine, hydrogen peroxide, and TPO. For the preheated composite, we have uh, camphor quinone, TPO, and ivocerine. So it's important to keep the photo initiators in mind. So the statistical analysis, the data is entered into the analysis software. 
uh, the, the data was normally distributed and homogeneous. Statistical analysis was performed according to the different experimental designs with level of significance alpha uh, 0.05, beta 0.2. Okay, now the good part, results and discussions. So this is the table projecting the findings of the light transmittance uh, uh, through the different lithium dislocate ceramic of different thicknesses. Uh, we're going to see uh, the violet light emitted from the multi-peak and single peak, the blue light, and the overall light transmission of each uh, uh, carry unit. So um, as expected, the violet light coming out from the single peak was almost negligible because it has only one LED chip emitting blue light, while for the uh, violet light in the multi-peak, uh, it was way better. Um, for the single peak, the blue light uh, has a, had a higher light transmittance in comparison to the blue light emitted from the multi-peak, which is interesting. Um, and sorry, and the total uh, of the single peak had uh, was also slightly higher than the total of uh, the the light being transmitted of a multi-peak unit. So, okay. So in order to comprehend this result, we simplified it into a graph. Uh, so the single peak would have 1.6% of light being emitted in violet and 98.4% of light being emitted in blue, while for the multi-peak, 27.4% uh, for violet, 72.6% in blue. Okay, now for the degree of conversion. So as we said, we tested out Verilink LC, Verilink DC, and uh, uh, Tetric Prime. So uh, these three different type of cement were tested uh, um, using multi-peak and single peak. Uh, and the baseline was obtained uh, with no ceramic for each, just the cement and uh, one time cured with 40 seconds and the other time cured with 10 seconds. So um, interestingly, we found that uh, the no curing very link uh, aesthetic LC with no ceramic, uh, uh, only using 10 seconds, had a significant difference between being cured with multi-peak and single peak while for the others uh, we didn't see any um, significant difference now for the uh, very link lc being cured with a multi-peak it cured up to two uh, two up to two and then it fell short with having the uh, degree of conversion being below 80 percent of uh, uh, the maximum threshold which means it wasn't uh, curing efficiently so we have as we can see, 2.5, uh, we had 79%. For the three, we had 75%. Um, while using single peak, uh, we can see it cured up to one millimeter and then it fell short. Uh, so we can see when it was 1.5, 2, 2.5, and 3, it was below the uh, maximum threshold of 80. So, and this is uh, mainly because as we said, we have alternative photo initiator and Verilink LC, so we need violet light, and it's it's not there in the single peak. So Verilink for the Verilink DC, um, it did uh, a better job. So uh, as we can see, it cured up to uh, three, up to two point five. For three, uh, it fell below 80%, and that's for the single peak. For the multi-peak, it's actually cured all the way. So um, it was all above 80%. So for the Tetric Prime, this was, sorry, this was interesting because both of them had uh, the same results. We can see that um, both of them uh, had the limit of one millimeter for, for multi-peak and single peak. And uh, this is basically because Tetric Prime has camphor quinone, and it depends on the blue light uh, from both the multi-peak and the single peak. Sorry. Okay, so to better comprehend this, so let's see the light beam profile of the curing light. 
So um, the for the dual peak, which is the multi-peak, we have blue and violet. You can see that the blue uh, light of a dual peak is kind of a little bit off-centered, um, and the violet light is on the right uh, bottom corner, while for the single peak, it's uh, mainly on the center. Okay, now, um, now the light beam profiled through the other ceramic thicknesses. So we can see here that um, we have still uh, the hot spot in the center until like 1.5. You can see how the violet was highly attenuated and uh, the single peak had general higher irradiance in comparison to the blue light of the uh, dual peak. So, uh, this would lead me to um, mention the limitation is that we measured uh, we measured it onto the center. We did not uh, map it. So this is one of the limitation of this study. And also, this would uh, led me to um, highlight the importance of uh, having the right spectral because. Even as we see that the single peak had higher irradiance, the multi-peak uh, did a better job uh, curing the the resin, the experimental resin-based uh, cements. So it's not about having uh, the higher energy quantity; it's about having it in the right spectrum. And um, also, this uh, would let me to stress on the importance of having manufacturers uh, actually specifying uh, and quantifying the amount of photo initiators used in the resin base and the right light cure unit that we should use uh, uh, for, for that resin based material. And that a single radiometer would fail to address that the multi-peak did better in curing uh, uh, the resin based materials that we had. Okay, so future studies, um, would include comparing exper experimental resin containing alternative photo initiators with the classical CQ amine system and quantifying the amount of initiator consumed in each composition um, and the ratio of blue to violet light emitted from light curing units and its impact on the degree of conversion of resin based materials. So, to conclude, the Verilink aesthetic LC cured to up to 0.5 ceramic thickness when using the single peak LCU for 10 seconds and cured up to two millimeter using uh, multi-peak. So therefore it is recommended to use multi-peak when curing Verilink aesthetic LC. And if we were to use the single peak, then increase the, the curing time to 40 seconds at least. So for the Verilink aesthetic DC, it had the best degree of polymerization results among all the other tested dresden based cements as the ceramic increased in its thickness. When using single peak LCU, it cured up to 2.5 mm and then fell short. And for the Tetric Prime, it showed uh, that we did not have any difference between the two types of LCU because it has a camphor quinone as a photo initiator, and we can use both interchangeably. The limitation is not to go beyond one millimeter of ceramic thickness since it depends majorly on the light received, unlike the other resin-based cements. Thank you all for uh, paying attention. And this is my contact details. Um, Please reach out if you have any questions or comments. And um, I think if we had any questions on the comment we uh, comment section, we would uh, I would gladly like to answer them. So thank you so much. I'll stop sharing my screen. Excellent presentation, Sarah. I'm oh. I'm very happy. Oh my god, <laughs> you did that everything nine months. Oh my god. It took me with your help, of course. <laughs> Dr. Lorenzo is here. It took me like two years to, to do something like similar. You're unbelievable. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. Let me thank you so much. Thank you. So we have here very, very uh good questions here. So Marcel is asking, and then this question is very hot on topic as well. So recently they released the new curing lights, like the Monet curing light that basically 
that curing light, they claim they have high power energy and all that in the laser curing light. So Marcel is asking if high energy with the Monet laser light could compensate the narrow wavelength range of the curing unit. What do you think? You are mute. Just, just unmute yourself real quick. I'm so sorry. Okay, so the question is to compensate for having uh, uh, a, a smaller diameter of the light curing tip. That's what the question is. Having a small, uh, narrow spectrum. So for example, having a narrow spectrum. Okay. Yeah. Do you think a narrow yeah. spectrum, if you have a narrow spectrum curing light, if you compensate in energy, could you at some point get the material cured well? By increasing the time? By increasing the time, you can. Yeah, yeah. I think that increasing the time would actually compensate, and uh, but also we need the right spectrum. So if, for example, we increase the 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 curing time, but then the frequency is not the right uh, frequency needed for the photo initiator in the system to actually be activated and produce free radicals, then it, it would be useless. Okay. So, oh yeah, that's good. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, no, that's great. And on, on these lines, another question that appears here is if that energy is not being used, could that energy be transformed in heat in the material and cause damage? What do you think? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, I've read somewhere that um, increasing the, the curing time would produce more heat and that would actually have some like adverse effect on the curing. So, but of course, we're going to have uh, Mr. <laughs> Felix. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the expert having his opinion on that. That's great. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, anyone want to unmute yourself and ask questions to Sarah? Let me see who is in here. I'm I'm with like three computers here trying to to manage that. I'll uh, I'll uh, it's Chris here. I'll uh, throw something at you, Sarah. Great job on on the presentation. Great project. Uh, is this something that you're going to be presenting uh, and writing up uh, for for publication uh, in the not too distant future? Yes. Probably that's the plan. <laughs> very, very good. Uh, you know, one of the things as with new initiators hitting the market and, and Evo Serene being one of them, and it falls kind of in this kind of, you know, between the major violet and the major blue range. And so we're always kind of wondering, you know, is blue light enough to cure it? And so uh, your findings are, you know, it seems like it, it certainly will not cure it as well as using the proper wavelengths in the violet region, um, mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, there is some compensation if you, you add more of the blue energy. Um, but overall, do you feel that for this uh, Evo Serene uh, initiator, um, that the benefits are enough to, to require that it is better or safer to be using a light that has both uh, wavelengths in the violet and blue range? Yeah, well, I think uh, since the Verilink Aesthetic Dual Cure actually had the Iviserine, and when it, when we used the Multi Peak, it cured up to three millimeters. So I, I think it's working. Uh, it's working fine. And uh, as we were reading about the uh, Iviserine being uh, color more color stable uh, than, uh, of course, camphor quinone. So I think it's uh, it's the material of choice it's more color stable and uh when curing with the multi-peak it cured up to three millimeters so we we wouldn't be worried about yellowing in the future very good very good i received one more question here in the chat from mm -hmm. dr richard Price. thank you so much richard to joining us today it's a pleasure to have you here so it's like it's hard to present on this talk when Richard is in the audience. He's the expert. Thank you so much. So his question is related to the calculation of the degree of conversion. He asked us uh, how do we how we calculated that. So I will help Sarah on that because I was the one that set up the, the FTIR for her. So what we did, we used the area of the spectrum in wave numbers. 
And one thing there is important when you're dealing with these types of materials, especially the new generation of material that doesn't have any BGMA or any aromatic rings on the composition, you have to find on the composition something that will give you uh, a baseline for the analysis. So in our, uh, in what we did, we used the stretches of NH in the urethane uh, UDMA resin that has in all of them. So we could have uh, a very precise measurement across all the, the materials. So that's something that I think Dr. Rugberg, he, uh, he published that a long time ago, and Dr. Sansbury talking about which stretches are reliable to measure degree of conversion, and then we base on that. And it's very important because in our pilot tests, we're just joking that we're the fathers of uh, pilot testing here. We found that for some composites, uh, when we try to use the stretch of the aromatic rings, the classical 1610, it doesn't calculate well. And then you end up with degree of conversions that are not within the 100% range. So that's the way that we did. And if you, if you need anything from us, we are happy to share uh, the, the methods as well. And Sarah is writing the paper for that, so that will mm -hmm. be submitted yeah. soon. So the other thing, did you look using the resin composite, how much violet light penetrates beyond two millimeters? No, we didn't look how much goes through the two millimeters composite. And what is an interesting find is that the lithium disilicate has a completely different behavior in light transmission. So we see that the violet light is much more attenuated in composite than in ceramics. And that we found this trend for Empress as well. So this show that the absorption of the material or ceramic materials is kind of more like, uh, it can let the, the lower, uh, the higher frequency energy pass through better. So that's why we found those results where two millimeters, three millimeters, it's reasonable with violet light. Uh, so we haven't uh, think about measuring through the, the composite. And one thing that I, I, I see is that normally preheated composite end up with a higher uh, film thickness than the regular cements. So is the bottom layer of the composite getting enough energy to cure and get to the properties that it's being claimed? So, uh, so the, those things are, uh, are to be considered. And another question that uh, Dr. Price asked is regarding the wave number that we use. I don't remember by heart now. I think it was 437 or 430. I can send you exactly what was the, the wave numbers that we use for that. I don't remember. Now, I, when I go to the FTIR, I create the settings and I put the macros. So <laughs> we can calculate automatically. So I don't remember now, but I can send you exactly the wave numbers. If I'm not wrong, it's 1437. Uh, uh, and the, the stretches for the double bonds are 640 cent, uh, uh, centimeters. Uh, minus one. Very good. Thank you so much for your questions, Dr. Bryce. Anyone else want to unmute yourself or ask on the chat? Mateus, I might uh, bring up one more point uh, just uh, as you were talking. Um, you know, there's one theory or hypothesis that I have that I haven't had a chance uh, to, uh, to test out myself in the lab. And you were talking about light transmission through ceramics versus composites. And, you know, why could there be a potentially a discrepancy on composites for, for transmission of violet wavelengths? And so I've always had a hypothesis that once you kind of make that commercial material and you start to add in these, uh, these, uh, you, these um, curing inhibitors, uh, you know, usually they are made to filter out that UV light. So it was something that I was never able to really conduct to show that once you get into this, uh, this filtering out of the violet wavelengths, uh, is it because of these uh, UV stabilizer components that are mixed in? Had you ever had a chance to look into that? Or, or is that uh, just a hypothesis I'm looking to? <laughs> yeah, that's a good hypothesis. I never on. thought about that. Maybe Dr. Lear or Dr. Oliveira, they have experience on formulating composites. Maybe you have a... a it makes totally sense because we'll, they will absorb with starting at, I think uh, Dr. Oliveira has some papers. It goes up to how much, Diane? 
is up to three, four hundred. The amines absorption. Four hundred, yeah. Some of them uh, they have that sharp cutoff there. So if your peak of your violet LED tends to be around four hundred or especially lower, that uh, filtering effect seems to increase. Now we've seen some of those violet chips come up to you know four ten, four twenty, and and maybe that could be the reason. Yeah. I, I see some students just writing down the project. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would That's love to, you know, it's something that uh, I've thought of for a while, uh, you know, where I'm at now, I don't get to do as much uh, of that investigation uh, research as, as I'd like to, but I, I love to collaborate. So I, I, you know, I, I would love to collaborate on that if that's possible. <laughs> oh, sure, sure thing. <laughs> Always good. And another thing that, uh, I was thinking about the other day and discussing with Dr. Lee was if you look on the, uh, the manufacturing process of a ceramic and a composite, the contamination on ceramic is like, it, it can have contamination on a, on a ceramic. And when I say contamination, I'm including like air uh, and voids, things like in, the, in that direction. In composites, uh, you have the vacuum, you have all the precautions of doing that, but during the, the, the formulation, it can end up having some little voids. And there are some studies showing with micro CT and nano CT, there are some voids in the composite. So I, I think the different in the refractive index from the formulation and the air that is entrapped in the composite can spread the light a little bit more. This is a very, area to, very good area to investigate. So I hope we can do some studies on, on that direction as well. Very good. Any, any extra questions? Uh, just a quick one from me here, Franklin. Um, Sarah, I was just wondering, uh, where did you get the 10 second cure time for your studies for? So the 10 second, yeah, Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's fine, you can go, but- No, you, you are the one. We read the, we, we were both reading the brochure, so it, it stated that uh, 10 second would be enough. Okay, because I'm just reading the instructions for use and it says 10 seconds per millimeter of ceramic, right? So which means that if you're using just 10 seconds for greater than one millimeter, you're not technically sticking with the instructions from the manufacturer? Yes. Because it recommends 10 seconds for one millimeter thick ceramic. Yeah, layer. that's true. That's one thing that we're gonna start doing as well because uh, because this project was done in a short period, we couldn't expand too much the sample size. So our idea now is to narrow uh, those uh, variables in the study and try now to understand how the radiant exposure will affect each one of those millimeters. So that's a very important question. Uh, we saw that on the manufacturer and then we decide that we're gonna try to extrapolate to see if it's possible to do what's gonna happen in one, two millimeters. So as you can see, for the light cure cement, if you use a uh, multi-peak, you're gonna achieve the two millimeters that's yeah. beyond the one, but with a single peak is not the reality, showing that the importance of using the, the right spectrum. But this is a very, very good point, frankly. Thank you for, for that. Very good. All right, so I will pass this. Thank you so much, Sarah. Brilliant presentation, brilliant work. Thank you, Dr. Pereira, to bring all these amazing students to us. Um, so now I will pass to Dr. Felix to go ahead and share a little bit about his expertise. So just a quick introduction. So uh, Chris Felix is a chief scientist at the Blue Analytics with over 16 years of dental materials research experience. So he co-authored more than 50 publications in, with leading experts, and he always uh, do research co collaborations to try to bridge the gap between research and everyday clinical practice. He's the company founder, uh, and he worn many hats uh, at the company while he was in Downhouse University Department of Dental Clinical Science as well. So uh, today's seminar, uh, he will cover a little bit about the blue light analytics story. And also we're gonna cover a lot about curing lights and you're gonna learn a lot from him. So help me welcoming uh, Dr. Chris Felix. Thank you very much, uh, Mateus, uh, for the, the wonderful introduction. And uh, you know, I'm glad that uh, Dr. Price is, is also here. Uh, 
Uh, he and I have uh, have worked together uh, over many years, and uh, you know, uh, as as a founder, uh, uh, Dr. Price and and one other uh, individual, we were the ones who started the Blue Light back in in 2009. So it's uh, it's great, uh, you know, to tell the story, to see what we learn, and and how we continue to. Uh, you know, try to, um, you know, help uh, with everyday uh, clinical practice. Uh, so you've done a lot of uh, a good uh, intro. Uh, you know, one correction that I tend to make is, uh, you know, I, I never actually did my doctorate degree. I think as I, I finished my, uh, my, uh, my undergraduate degree um, was right around the same time we were starting Blue Light Analytics. So I, I often say that, uh, you know, Blue Light Analytics has been my, uh, my, my, my doctorate equivalent project, if that's uh, fair enough. So, um, but yeah, like I said, uh, this, uh, you know, this, this was born out of, uh, out of research, uh, you know, at, at Dalhousie University. Uh, so working with, uh, you know, Dr. Price and, and my brother, uh, who is a dentist uh, before, while well, he was in uh, dental school, I was uh, studying uh, chemistry, material science, and, uh, you know, uh, Corey was doing, my brother Corey was doing some work with uh, Dr. Price and asked if I would come in and help uh, run some samples. And, uh, you know, and then sure enough, uh, you know, that went well and, and the years rolled by. And, uh, you know, so really uh, everything started, uh, you know, at Dalhousie University, you know, uh, testing, testing lights, uh, so of course, uh, very early on there, uh, you know, Dr. Price certainly is uh, is the pioneer in, in in raising that importance of you know of, of the curing light, and you know as uh, we've seen the years go by, it's uh, you know it's still uh, you know uh, an issue that's so important. But if you go back 10, 15, even 20 years ago, um, not a lot of emphasis was put on the importance of the curing light. It was usually in the techniques or the materials. Uh, and the curing light, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, was an afterthought, uh, you know, in the education. Uh, so even at the universities, you know, you teach and practice uh, cutting restorations. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, when it came to the curing light, it was, uh, you know, and then you, uh, you like cure. There wasn't really a hands-on way to teach it. Uh, you know, it just seemed to be pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, but I think over time, what we were able to do is to show that like any, uh, you know, important critical process, um, you know, teaching uh, the proper skills to, to, to do light curing uh, day in, day out is, is, is very much important. And, you know, when you look at light cure dentistry, uh, you know, it's really uh, uh, improved things by saving time, not having to wait for, uh, you know, self-curing materials to cure. Uh, and it's not just composites, uh, you know, it's, it's really a lot of areas of, of dentistry that rely on light cured materials, whether it's a, you know, a composite, a bond, a, a cement, a liner, a sealant, uh, you know, there are several uh, categories of, of light cured materials. Uh, and the success of those materials are absolutely uh, dependent on, on the light. And of course, you know, in, in, in an everyday uh, uh, practitioner's day, uh, you know, they're, they're using the lights uh, very frequently. Uh, you know, and at least half of the procedures they're doing, if not more, depending on, on their, uh, their general practice. So as uh, Sarah did a great job covering a bit of, uh, a bit of the history of, of light curing, starting off with real UV, uh, you know, cured resins, uh, you know, which of course have their, uh, you know, issues around being harmful, uh, you know, potentially to the patient and to the operator. Uh, and, and of course, halogen lights uh, came into play uh, after that, uh, you know, heavily filtered, uh, you know, like hair dryers, the fans in them to cool the filter, uh, very inefficient, had to be plugged in. Uh, and of course, as uh, plasma arc lights uh, came to be, uh, that was the first kind of taste of real fast curing. Five seconds uh, in, in a lot of cases was that claim. Um, plasma arc lights were really great, really good optics in them, the, the, the Denmat sapphires. Um, but they're big and bulky and their source would uh, degrade like most other sources and, and quite expensive to, to service and replace and not very portable. Uh, so they had, uh, you know, a, a lifespan, uh, you know, in the later 90s, maybe early 2000s. But of course, uh, when LEDs uh, hit the market, 
their efficiency, especially for the, the main photo initiator, Campo Canone, using blue LEDs, um, you know, the portability, uh, you know, no light is being really filtered. It's being just passed through the, the light guide or lens. Uh, so that efficiency certainly began to take over. And I'm, I'm pretty sure from our data, about 95% of the lights in the market, you know, are LED today. Um, but as was mentioned earlier, uh, you know, Monet, uh, the Monet laser light, um, you know, this is, uh, this is the real deal. Uh, you know, this light is uh, putting out a very high intensity, uh, the optics obviously, uh, that come with the laser, uh, you know, I think, uh, it could be a really good thing. Maybe someday lasers take over, but I think until, uh, you know, they're well tested to make sure that they're safe, you know, what is the optimal output and, and curing times depending on the material. So I, I imagine, uh, there's a few folks out there doing uh, projects uh, and studying this light. Uh, certainly with a laser light, you, you don't want to be handing this to an untrained assistant. Uh, so there's lots of more implications, especially relative to, to the heat that, uh, that this unit can deliver. So yeah, so it could be uh, another wave takeover. Maybe all lights will be laser lights in 10 years time. But you know, I always advise uh, you know, to be careful. And, and certainly as, as those working with lasers in labs, you know, uh, at the university, uh, you, you treat lasers with, uh, you know, the respect and caution. And so, uh, you know, that's really where uh, I have concern is, is making sure the lights are used in a safe manner, uh, you know, not looking away while you're light curing uh, with a laser light for sure. So we'll see how that unfolds, uh, but it's, uh, it's really interesting uh, as, as this light hits, uh, hits the market. So for myself, uh, you know, uh, a time where I worked, uh, in uh, Dr. Price's lab for, for, for many, many years, uh, you know, doing bond strength testing, you know, working with materials, looking at the differences of how that material is cured and then bonded, you know, especially to enamel and, and dentin surfaces, just running samples after samples after samples, looking at differences. Uh, I'd really uh, enjoy that, that research process of, you know, collecting data, analyzing it, making a discovery, learning something new. Uh, it's still uh, probably my favorite uh, kind of work to do, although my, my roles and responsibilities have, have changed over the years. But that, you know, that feeling of that discovery is, is, is really exciting as, as a researcher. And, and certainly, you know, what we've been able to do is to carry, uh, you know, some, some discoveries on to uh, creating a company, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, so here's uh, the unit that, uh, that we had at Dalhousie in my uh, tenure there. Uh, you know, uh, we, we started to, to do a lot of measurements of FTIR, ATR, degree of conversion, you know, looking at those uh, polymerization kinetics. Uh, you know, we're looking at it, at, you know, at the, at, at the surface level. We never, I never did a lot of the Raman, the, you know, measurement through the, the, the complete sample as an average kind of DC. Uh, but really, I mean, where the material needs to be cured certainly is in that bottom surface, so it adheres and bonds to the, the, the substrate uh, layer below it. Uh, so starting to understand how, to, uh, how materials cure and looking at those kinetics and looking at the rate of reaction is, is quite quick. And of course, that post the uh, polymerization effect, uh, you know, over the next uh, pretty much 24 hours. So, you know, we just started to generate a lot of data and, and it was really kind of really exciting uh, and then uh, with the hardness testing, we, we had a great hardness tester, or there is a great hardness tester at Dalhousie that, uh, you know, uh, you could program to do hundreds of measurements per surface. So you could profile that, that whole top topography. So instead of just doing a few measurements in the middle, uh, as we know, uh, you know, curing lights may not be so uniform or some more than others, uh, you know, what happens across that whole uh, uh, surface uh, of, that, uh, of that material. And so we would, you know, run samples and run samples. I'm, I'm pretty sure by the end of it, I, I hit over a million uh, samples that were, uh, were set up through the, the automated uh, hardness tester at Dalhousie. And it started to tell us a lot of things. This was one of the first times that I started to understand the difference in some of these materials that had alternate initiators and you know the implications of of uh, the like we we're talking about the violet uh, wavelength transmission through the materials where we could see that on the top surface uh, when you cured with a, a multi-peak or broad spectrum curing light you know the top surface would get you know much harder than if you cured it with a, a single peak a single blue peak curing light if it had those alternate initiators 
Um, but then, you know, we started to, to not see the differences at the bottom surface. And so this was, you know, that first kind of aha moment here where we're like, wait a second, you know, well, if these alternative initiators were, you know, almost thought of as co-initiators, um, but we later kind of found out for certain ones of them that they, they truly did need, uh, you know, wavelengths within their, their region. And I think these ones, a lot of them we were looking at was TPO, which is a little further down the spectrum. Uh, so certainly um, it was really exciting. We started to, to, to kind of see uh, the effect uh, from the different wavelengths and, and the different photo initiators uh, in the material. So that was, uh, that was uh, quite, uh, quite an exciting, uh, you know, discovery. And, so, and of course, uh, other uh, test methods, uh, you know, that exist as ISO standards for, for, for this area of, of, of composites, let's say in particular, you know, there were a lot of limitations. Uh, and, and, and so certainly, uh, you know, for composites looking at depth of cure, uh, pre-2019 when they re-released uh, an update to that, uh, to that standard, you know, there was no quantification of the light whatsoever. Uh, so if, if a group did the depth of cure testing, you know, one uh, set of uh, protocols, uh, and if another group did it, even on the same materials, oftentimes we would see different results uh, being reported, uh, which I, I certainly believe could be traced back to how the samples uh, were light cured with what light, with what spectrum, uh, and so on. So it was really good to see that uh, standard uh, updated uh, in 2019. Uh, which now includes uh, reporting uh, some degree of data from from the light, uh, the spectrum, the the the, the light output. Um, it it doesn't go so specific as to get to the beam profile and to you know the actual amount of light hitting our our our, our mold here, where we have a, a four millimeter diameter uh, mold. And if you have a curing light, typically uh, that light tip is is much larger, and the average ratings from a curing light. Uh, can be much different than potential hotspot in the middle uh, delivering to that material. So to get a good correlation for this test, uh, definitely trying to correlate, you know, the amount of light energy uh, intensity and rate of, of energy delivery uh, really is important to get that correlation. Because again, if you have a hotspot of 2000 in that middle area, but an average intensity of 1000, and you try to do your correlation to your, your depth of cure uh, certainly, uh, that, that may or may not work out uh, as, as well. Uh, so again, it's nice to see uh, some of these uh, standards uh, you know, evolving, but it's always as a researcher to keep in mind if you're going to do some correlations to, to really make sure you're correlating that, that energy delivery to the sample itself uh, and then doing your, your, your uh, materials properties testing uh, after that. The other ISO that uh, we talk uh, quite a bit about is uh, the one around uh, curing light measurement, uh, the 10650. Uh, so again, there was uh, you know a, a certainly a change over here uh, in 2018 in this case, uh, where the previous method, um, you know, to adhere to the standard, you had to incorporate a lot of filters in the setup, and uh, you know, my opinion is that uh, the quantitative measurements in those uh, in that method was was certainly suspect. Uh, you know, depending on your setup, the distance from the filters, from the, you know, the, 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 the linear sensor uh, detector. Um, so it was really kind of hard to figure out, you know, what truly is the intensity in all of these different sections of the spectrum without using a spectrometer. And so as, uh, you know, spectrometers certainly have reduced uh, in price, affordability, increased in quality, certainly, uh, you know, miniaturized uh, certainly to a certain degree, um, you know, which made spectrometer quite easily or readily available, especially for a lab testing light. So it was really great to have that spectrometer inclusion uh, into the method because now it really gives you uh, a good way to define different areas in the spectrum. Certainly uh, that below 385 and above 515 uh, and certainly in, in introducing a limit maybe early on, uh, there wasn't a limit needed to the intensity coming out of a curing light. Uh, but as lights have increased uh, in intensity significantly, uh, they, they introduced in 2018 uh, uh, 4,000 milliwatts per centimeter squared as the average intensity uh, exiting the light tip as a, uh, uh, as a maximum limit. Uh, although we know in some areas of the beam uh, that that maximum limit can be exceeded, uh, but at least there's something now and it, it's, it's certainly uh, improved uh, in 2018. 
Uh, and as we learn more and do more research, uh, you know, the goal here is to, is to keep trying to improve uh, these standards so that, uh, you know, when, when these measure, measurements are being made in different places in, in the world or different labs, you know, we're, we're following the standards so our, our data can, can correlate. All right, uh, so, uh, you know, and then the time before blue light, uh, you know, again, uh, many clinicians, uh, you know, would make observations of, of materials in, in patients, uh, you know, composite materials, uh, discoloring or, or increasing wear, lower bond strengths, uh, reduced fracture toughness. And, you know, the, the, the really the thought was that it's a material problem. You know, material manufacturer would get a call from a clinician and say, look, there's just something wrong with your material. And, uh, you know, not thinking that, you know, maybe it's how the curing light uh, was used or how long it was used for or some other details. So, again, you know, knowing that there were, were issues out there, we wanted to kind of study these interactions between uh, lights uh, and materials. And so, you know, really, yeah, you know, we, we came up with a hypothesis, uh, Dr. Price and I together, um, that, well, you know, maybe it, it truly is the light, you know, uh, we, we like your samples in the lab, you know, so well, uh, we control it very well, there's no movement, sometimes we'll clamp everything together, and then we can produce, uh, you know, uh, material measurements, uh, you know, quite accurately, but, you know, how easy is it to cure in a patient's mouth? Uh, you know, there's a whole other host of challenges. And so, you know, when we designed our first uh, patient simulator prototypes, you know, we, we tested the, the, the students at the school and just let them do whatever they naturally thought was okay. And uh, so this is certainly where we started to see, uh, you know, that light curing wasn't as simple as potentially thought of. And so uh, some of the students had no idea if they were good, what their result was. Some of the students had no idea if they didn't do so well. Uh, some students thought holding the light further away so you get good coverage uh, was a better idea. Uh, some thought uh, holding it at a at an angle might be might be better. Um, and so it really what we found was really that that inconsistency uh, across that group. Uh, and of course, we 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 did testing with many groups uh, after that, and it was kind of this aha moment of wow, um, you know, light curing is not as easy as possible what do we need to do to light cure more consistently? Uh, so not overly complicated, certainly having a hands-on, uh, you know, a hands-on way of, of developing uh, those skills and, and that feedback uh, to know uh, how you were doing, um, but not overly complicated as, as a skill set to perform light curing, uh, you know, wearing eye protection or making sure, uh, you know, to pay attention to, to what you're doing during that curing process. You know, we hear so many stories of, uh, you know, uh, light curing operators looking away because they don't want to, to, to damage their eyes. And of course, you know, unless the light is very well stabilized, uh, you know, the light certainly will move, the patient will move and, and certainly uh, end up potentially on the wrong tooth, uh, you know, reducing that energy delivery uh, to the material. So really uh, that position of that light tip directly over the material uh, you know, so that's absolutely critical and you're not sure if that's the case unless you're really paying attention to what you're doing or stabilizing this uh, really well. So this was a really uh, exciting uh, aha moment as well to say, okay, well, maybe we can help with that uh, education uh, and training. Uh, and certainly that's, uh, that's what we went on to do. And uh, as, uh, you know, as we developed this uh, at Dalhousie, um, you know, eventually in 2009, uh, you know, an investor was uh, coming to the university to look for a technology to, to invest in. Uh, you know, our, our universities are, are developing all sorts of great technologies, but, you know, you need that commercialization path for that technology to, to be brought to the market. And so uh, this is, uh, was a very interesting time where we had developed the patient simulator. We were doing some testing with our, our original kind of makeshift resin calibrator, studying those uh, transmission properties, preparing samples, and we started to uh, we started with um, a, a standardized set of measurements for curing lights. So these were some of the first kind of products or services um, that we had uh, had basically developed very early on for blue light when we started the company. And what was really great about this is that we were able to collect data in a clinical way. 
uh, via the patient simulator. And then we were able to take those differences in amounts of energy delivered you know, clinically through the simulator and then cure samples to that degree. And so this kind of gave us a, a really new way uh, to look at you know, basically, uh, you know, clinic, clinical based research is, is, is trying to collect data in a clinical matter and then take it to the lab and see, you know, what were the, 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 the impact of those, those variables uh, clinically. And so this is kind of where we started to learn a lot more about, about light curing. And uh, we, we started to work on developing this concept because it, it's truly not just the light. Uh, although the light, you know, absolutely plays a role. It has characteristics, uh, you know, whether it's its output, its beam profile, you know, uh, how collimated the design uh, of the light. So certainly, uh, you know, I think we had the feeling that a lot of clinicians think that a light is a light. There's blue light coming out of it. It must be the same or it must be working. And there wasn't really a lot of a knowledge of the differentiation of the different curing lights on the market. So we wanted to really... I start to generate data on that to kind of show that really, you know, curing lights can have a significantly different performance. Um, but a big one is the operator, uh, the operator technique, uh, you know, without having any training, uh, you know, and, and an assumption that the process is quite easy, uh, you might get enough light to cure that top surface of the material quite well, and you test it with the Explorer, and it seems like it's cured, but, you know, if you're placing a two millimeter or more increment of material, uh, and you can't really access the bottom of that increment, uh, certainly, uh, you know, that's where the worry that you don't get that direct feedback that maybe the light curing didn't happen. You know, if someone's doing the light curing and they get disrupted or interrupted or looking away or, you know, these are all, you know, things that can really reduce that, that light delivery to the material itself. Uh, so again, operator technique is, is probably the biggest uh, if I had to, to, to venture uh, an opinion there. Um, but of course, the restoration characteristics also play a role. You know, whether you're doing, uh, you know, a, a restoration in an anterior tooth that's very easily accessible uh, versus, you know, maybe a distal buckle or a location that's quite hard to get to, um, you know, that access, uh, you know, if you're doing a, a, a class two on a molar and, uh, you know, the matrix band is in place and, and the design of the light forces you to be, uh, you know, not in a good position, then of course there's, there's different strategies that might need to be uh, implemented to make sure that that material is, is certainly fully cured all the way through the increment. Uh, and then materials, uh, you know, materials are, you know, not all composites are the same, not all bonds are the same. Uh, you know, they come with instructions for use. Uh, you know, it's really important to follow those, uh, follow those instructions and read them quite well um, because materials can have different uh, opacities, uh, you know, certainly uh, increments, shades, uh, you know, uh, tran translucencies. Uh, so again, you know, you can't really treat all materials the same, and it's really important to, to review some of those instructions, which we'll do a little bit uh, today as well, too. And, and as uh, Sarah was talking about, that matching of the spectral emission to the photo initiators, uh, again, is, is, is quite important. So curing light characteristics, uh, you know, some of the, the ones we've come across. So, uh, looking at all sorts of different lights on the market. Um, you know, having a good paintbrush, I always kind of say is, you know, if you have a really small uh, tip, you know, placing that tip, especially in a posterior location can be quite challenging because again, making sure you have good overlap is really important. So if you're, you know, looking at an MOD or a very large restoration and you have a, an eight millimeter tip, which really could have an active area of seven uh, or lower, uh, looking at that overlapping kind of cure uh, you know, might be very critical. Uh, you know, of course, there are some light guides that, uh, you know, are in that 10 millimeter, uh, you know, diameter, which seems to be a pretty good area for covering, uh, you know, an occlusal surface of an adult molar or, you know, a larger, uh, you know, uh, incise or facial surface. Uh, and certainly there are some, some larger uh, uh, guides as well, too, up and around 12 millimeters. That 12 millimeters gives you, again, a little bit more of a, of a fudge factor in your positioning, uh, you know, if you've got good coverage. But, of course, uh, you know, that area also can, can impact the intensity 
Uh, if you have the same power with the different areas, of course, your intensity is, is going to go down. So if you're using a larger guide, uh, certainly uh, you want to know how much power is coming out uh, and how much heat is generated uh, or, or how much intensity that is, and maybe you have to cure for longer. So again, uh, those are variables that can certainly uh, increase or decrease the risk. And the angle of those light guides, especially those lights, uh, you know, the eBay, the Amazon lights that you can get for, for, for $20 or $30, uh, you know, come with these angles that are almost impossible to place on an occlusal surface, uh, you know, with a, a direct 90 degree angle to the, to the material, um, you know, to get good light transmission. So again, the placement and accessibility of the different lights can play a huge role. Uh, so having a, a, certainly a lower profile tip is, is absolutely uh, the way to go to lower that, uh, that risk. Uh, of course, optics, uh, you know, uh, uh, making sure that the intensity is not changing too much as a function of distance. Uh, I know at some points there, there was a push uh, to these turbo light guides to, you know, in the race to increase intensity. Uh, of course, if you have a turbo light guide where you have a larger entrance and a smaller exit, you know, that's taking that power and then putting it over the smaller area, just like I was talking about, to get that higher uh, irradiance at that zero millimeter distance from the tip. But, you know, there's a, a, a cost to that in most cases is that a lot of the turbo light guides uh, tend to, to lose uh, their intensity over distance much faster than if the light is, is leaving the guide in a much more uh, collimated way. So, you know, if you have a curing light that has a drastic difference between its, you know, its output at zero or its output at, uh, you know, a clinically relevant distance, so certainly... You know, if you're you're placing that first increment at the bottom of a class two box with a matrix band in place, uh, certainly you can be quite far away from that first you know increment you're placing. So you know, if you're placing a two millimeter uh, increment uh, and the light is in that uh, that uh, you know six to eight millimeter distance away, uh, you may need to cure much longer. And and so you know, some things get said, and I remember one of the things that that, that was said quite often is that. Well, I'll do my increment buildup, and then I'll cure extra on, 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 the, on the final cure. Uh, but, of course, that bottom layer is not going to benefit as, you know, about 5 to 10% of the light will get through an average A2 shade. Uh, you know, if you're two or three increments in, the bottom of that box is not going to be uh, aided by that extra curing from the occlusal surface. Now, of course, removing the matrix band and curing interproximally for a class 2 uh, is definitely a very good practice. But... You know, the inside corner of that box where there could be some thicker dentin, uh, you know, it may not fully cure from that inside corner. So when you, when you do place that first increment uh, and cure it from the occlusal surface, typically that's when you have your best chance to get the light to and through the material uh, so to make sure that it's fully, fully cured in that inside uh, corner of the box. So again, but knowing how your light performs, uh, you know, if you do have to increase the curing time for that first increment to 20 seconds, and then as you get to your final increments and that distance is, uh, is, uh, is, is much smaller, uh, then maybe 10 seconds is, is likely to do it. So again, it, it really comes down to that uh, curing light performance knowing and knowing how your curing light uh, performs over distance. As we talked about uh, beam profiles, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, these assumptions that you know, well, it must just be uniform across the tip. Uh, you know, you can't really measure that with your eyes. Uh, uh, so again, uh, an assumption. Uh, but of course, some lights do have uh, have some hot spots uh, in the middle. In, in particular, uh, you know, there's another light here that has three LEDs. So those hot spots may not always be uh, in the middle. Uh, so again, you know, as manufacturers, as this kind of information is 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 has been out there. Uh, in research now for a while, hopefully it's starting to put more pressure on the manufacturers uh, to provide this kind of information. Uh, so you don't need to, clinicians don't need to go and dig through uh, some, some research papers that we do uh, to show some of these characteristics. I think it's, it's, it's quite an important uh, aspect is, is a relatively uniform beam profile. It doesn't need to be perfect, uh, but certainly, uh, you know, uh, it, should, uh, it should be quite a reasonable uh, to get a, a reasonable even cure. And so, of course, with some of the different lights from our halogen lights and pack lights and LED and, and now multi-peak LEDs, uh, you can see uh, the difference in the spectrum and, and where that light falls into the spectrum. And, of course, some of the initiators as well, which uh, Sarah did a great job uh, covering, is making sure you certainly will have 
you know, a better combination if you're using the appropriate light that has a spectral emission for those uh, photo initiators used uh, within the materials. And of course, you know, again, uh, Sarah had mentioned about uh, the challenges in trying to get a uniform configuration of, of LEDs when you're using uh, several different LEDs. And it it's, it's absolutely is a challenge. Uh, and some companies have certainly uh, sorted it out better than others, absolutely. Um, but there's always the worry. There are some lights out there. And, and this was an example of, of one, uh, one here that really had the violet uh, wavelengths uh, separated from the blue wavelengths. And so, you know, depending on the size of your restoration and, and the placement, uh, uh, certainly there are some, some good publications to show that, you know, depending on the curing time you're using and your technique, um, you know, uh, this uh, may affect uh, the resulting properties of, of the photo cured resins and the potential for long-term clinical success. So again, you know, if, if maybe one area where there's a margin that's not receiving enough light and the rest of the composite is cured, but there could be one little problem area that could uh, debond and of course micro leakage, secondary caries and all that escalation can, can happen. So again, it's uh, really important, uh, you know, to get this information you know, to users so that they can, you know, understand when they're getting a light, uh, you know, these are some of the characteristics to look for is, uh, is, is a nice uniform uh, beam profile. So another characteristics, of course, uh, you know, is, is around the amount of, of heat or energy delivered. So, you know, not just irradiance, but power, uh, you know, power is, is an important uh, aspect uh, as that certainly power is, is, you know, transmitted to the composite material, but it's also transmitted to the tooth overall in general. And so one of the, you know, the test methods that we, we had incorporated, uh, you know, was uh, taking some tissue implantable thermocouples, uh, you know, into a human tooth and, you know, running a, a simulation in a water bath. And, and again, you know, this test, you could cut all sorts of different kinds of preparations. Uh, you know, really, we have an MOD kind of cut here as well as a class five and just looked at how that energy can be transferred, especially to the pulp chamber. Uh, and so certainly, you know, when there's no material or no composite material there, uh, which is, is quite similar to, to placing a bonding agent, a thin film of a bonding agent, uh, you don't get any of the insulation properties, uh, you know, once you start to kind of put in, uh, you know, a couple of millimeters of composite. And so some curing lights, if they have a high power or high intensity output, um, you know, if they're used continuously for too long, uh, certainly this is where heat can, can begin to be a, a real issue. And so where, you know, back in the day when, when you had 40 or 60 second curing times and lights around five, 600 milliwatts per centimeter squared, you know, it didn't matter. You could cure for, you know, for hours and, and, and it wasn't enough to, to cause that buildup of heat within the tooth, uh, where now, uh, where lights are and, 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 and especially with, uh, uh, you know, the introduction of, of laser light curing, uh, you know, there's the concern here that the temperatures can, can, can increase quite quickly, if not using some type of heat management technique. Uh, so whether you're, you're breaking up uh, the curing in, in cycles, so you got to cure for 20 seconds and you have a high power light, you can do 10 seconds, you know, wait a little bit, do another 10 seconds, or, you know, if you want to do a straight 20 seconds and apply uh, a good stream of air while you're doing that, that certainly works uh, very well for keeping the tooth, uh, especially the tooth pulp, uh, nice and cool. Um, you know, you still want to be uh, conscious of, of, of overlapping, like if you're doing a class five and it's close to the, to the gingiva and, and the light tip is directly overlapping the gingiva, uh, certainly it, it can be uncomfortable as the patient kind of, you know, unfreezes. And so again, we want to make sure the patients are, are safe and, and, and not experiencing any issues related to heat, but absolutely it's something that needs to be managed and every user should have a good idea of, uh, of how much heat or how much power uh, their curing light uh, is producing. Again, uh, in our core concepts, so we already talked about operator technique. I, I still believe this is, you know, one of the, the, the biggest impacts, uh, you know, making sure uh, paying attention to what you're doing, oh, good overlap, good stabilization, uh, absolutely leads to, to consistent uh, light energy delivery. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, there's all sorts of challenges in, in the oral environment, uh, you know, where, you know, what tooth is being restored, you know, what arch, uh, you know, the accessibility of that location, the need to use a matrix band, uh, you know, the size of the restoration, uh, the ability of the patient to open, they're all challenges that doesn't, that makes, you know, every 
uh, like cured restoration, you know, it's not the same. So there, there, there are different techniques needed uh, to compensate when, you know, whether it's accessibility or size of the restoration, uh, you know, needs it. So again, uh, having a good understanding of, of those strategies uh, certainly will 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 help mitigate issues because, uh, as we know, uh, you know, inadequate inadequate curing to some degree uh, eventually is going to start to decrease that longevity. You know, increased chance of post op sensitivity, and of course, you know, uh, recurrent uh, recurrent decay. Now, uh, materials instructions for use. Uh, I spend a lot a lot of time reading them, and uh, you know, Franklin chimed in earlier with a comment there. We read instructions a lot. We, we talk with a lot of manufacturers. You know, we want to you know help, and I think instructions for use have have changed uh, over the years. Uh, of course, the equipment, the lights have changed over the years, uh, also. So it really is, uh, you know, important to um, to make sure that you know we're following the instructions from the manufacturer. Now, not every manufacturer is is equal. So what we're going to do is we're going to review a few of the instructions for you, is just to kind of comment on on some of the information that's being provided. I think certainly as we as researchers try to give good information to manufacturers on what information should be provided you know, to help, uh, you know, the, the clinicians using these, uh, these products and, and lights, uh, certainly around the initiators, as, as Sarah mentioned earlier, uh, you know, uh, I think some manufacturers have uh, provided that information, certainly uh, not all, and, and certainly not all within their instruction for use of the material. So here we have two instructions for use uh, here, uh, you know, one that's laid out reasonably well, uh, it says here, uh, you know, the curing light needs to be at least 400 milliwatts per centimeter squared uh, and in the range of 400 to 500 nanometers, which is a fairly typical range, uh, you know, that a lot of halogen lights were filtered to. Um, this is kind of that violet to, to, to blue range. Of course, LEDs, blue LEDs, typically uh, higher up in that range. Uh, um, but it's laid out, the instructions laid out quite well here. And, and as this was an instruction that had been you know, adopted to include a, a, a higher range uh, of light. So, of course, the lights between 1,000 and 2,000 uh, can use half of the curing time uh, than those in that kind of 400 to 1,000 range. Of course, there's some other things going on here. There's differences depending on the shades. Uh, you know, the dentin and darker shades uh, not only come with a longer curing time, but also uh, a, a shorter or a smaller increment. And so, you know, making sure, uh, you know, uh, clinicians are aware of, of these instructions in case they have to use uh, a material from, from one of these groups that they know uh, that they may need to reduce their increment or increase their curing time. Um, but this is pretty, this is pretty reasonable to follow. I think, you know, again, I think the initiator information would be great to have uh, in there as well. Um, one of the other instructions I have here from another company is, uh, you know, provides basically a lot of depth to cure testing. I think this is all ISO 4049 depth to cure testing. You know, they've taken three different light types, you know, several different intensities, uh, you know, several different curing times and, you know, provided some, some depth to cure. And, and this is a little, little bit hard to follow. It's, uh, you know, almost too much information. Uh, you know, so again here, it's, it's wondering what is the user going to do? What are they going to pick? Do they know the output of the light, um, the type of light that they're using? And so again, this uh, you know this may be a little too too much information. Now, if we look at some of the older older instructions for use, and this is where there is there there is a little bit of a, of a concern there. Certainly, is uh, you know a lot of the older materials you know came out when lights were in that you know four hundred to six hundred range. Uh, you know, this material is recommending a two millimeter increment, forty to sixty seconds cure. Uh, 60 seconds for the opaque, um, you know, 500 for halogen, 300 for LED. Um, you know, looking at the distance here, they even call out if that distance is more than five millimeters, you know, curing depth may be reduced. Uh, so again, there was some good stuff in these instructions that that's letting you know what you should be aware of. Uh, you know, leading to incomplete curing or discoloration or pulpitis complaints. So there is, you know, some warnings here in the material instruction. You know, but here is where the worry is if you have a light that's outputting, you know, 1500 or 2000 and you're curing for 40 or 60 seconds continuously, you know, that's where a heat uh, certainly can be a concern. And so, uh, again, making sure users are aware because they could be following the instructions for use just fine and, and potentially, 
ending up with uh, with with some issues, uh, you know, with, uh, with with heat generation certainly. Here's another instruction for use, uh, you know, that that says place increments, uh, you know, the first layer in a 0.5 or a 1.5, which is, you know, especially at the bottom of a of a deep box, is not a bad idea. Uh, you know, it's it's a great idea to be honest. And then as you build up to those two millimeter increments. Now, where this instruction falls a little bit short is it kind of gives you 600 as that changeover for the curing time. So cure each later, you know, if it's above 600, cure for 20 seconds. If it's below 600, cure for 40 seconds. But really, you know, if your light's outputting 100 milliwatts per centimeter square, is 40 seconds still enough? You know, what is that kind of minimum, uh, you know, radiance? And so certainly, you know, there's no lights out there that, that now that produce 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared, but if a light, uh, you know, over time and degradation or through maintenance or composite stuck on the tip or barriers, you know, have reduced that output, um, you know, it's important to have kind of a minimum uh, cutoff. And so here was another instruction here where, you know, they just provided a curing time with no intensity at all. And so again, you know, that is, is, is likely not enough to, to know how long to cure uh, with all of the different curing lights that are out there on the market today. Here's another instruction where they're actually calling out the initiator, which is great. Um, you know, in this case, this material is a camphor quinone only uh, initiator, and it's very much specializing or, or, or uh, specifying that 440 to 480, which is typically in that blue, uh, uh, you know, blue LED uh, range, uh, you know, cure for 10 seconds when using a light of a minimum radiance of 800. Uh, so that's really great. It, it gives a lower radiance and does have that 500 as a minimum uh, for the 20 second curing time. That's really great. Um, but then it has something at the bottom here, uh, where it says, you know, refer to the curing light manufacturer's instruction for use for compatibility and recommended uh, or curing recommendations. And I think that's important on the compatibility side, but, you know, the challenge is, you know, if a light manufacturer uh, provides a recommendation for their light, how could it satisfy all the instructions for use of all the light cured materials in the market? Uh, you know, whether it's a bulk fill material or an opaque material or a bonding agent, uh, you know, really the instructions should come from the material manufacturer quite specifically of what's required uh, or a range uh, where the material will function or has been tested uh, to function quite well. Because again, you know, there are lights that are quite ambitious in their claims and, uh, you know, claiming a, a one second cure for all materials on the market, doing a, a layer buildup and a three second cure, uh, you know, for either darker shades or on the final cure. Um, you know, again, if someone had bought this light and was following the light manufacturer's instruction with all of their materials, it's, it's likely things are, are probably not going to work out in, in some cases for sure. So again, uh, material manufacturers, they, they really are, are, are responsible for providing that information. And that's where we should look to, uh, to satisfy those, those instructions for use. So certainly as it comes to light measurement, uh, you know, uh, how do you measure your light? Uh, you know, typically uh, most clinicians uh, might have, uh, have or have access to a dental radiometer. Um, lots of publications out there. I'm sure lots of you guys know, uh, you know, some of these can have varying results, uh, you know, depending on the light uh, and the meter. Uh, so here's an example just of one light measured on four meters. We get a, a pretty significant range from, from 500 to 2000 milliwatts per centimeter squared. If you were using that to, to figure out what curing time you should use from your instructions for use, uh, you'd end up in, in, with quite different uh, curing times. So again, in this case, uh, the manufacturer's data for the light was 1500 and the actual output was 1100. Uh, so there really was kind of a spread on the upper end and, and, and lower end there. And even you know, how some of these radiometers are designed, uh, you know, the, the lateral variability and positioning uh, you know, can have a, a pretty big impact. And you know, so there are some good meters out there and, and Ivoclar does make a, a, good, a good meter in the blue phase two meter, certainly. Um, but, you know, it's great at measuring Ivoclar lights and there are some lights that uh, it may not measure as good, um, but, you know, at least having a relative measurement, even if it's not correct, monitoring your light over time is still a value because uh, you never know, there could be a sudden change uh, near light output, uh, you know, the light could be dropped, uh, other issues that uh, could, could cause a, a catastrophic decrease in, in output, not a complete failure, 
Uh, and so again, you know, this is absolutely uh, better than not measuring uh, your lights at all. And so, you know, and we always, we, we looked at, you know, why do some of these meters not measure, you know, all of the lights in the market accurately? And again, you know, they, they're, they're based on a sensor, you know, they're calibrated, they're tested with certain lights, uh, but there's all sorts of lights out there with different tip sizes, different spectra. Uh, of course, some of these sensors are, are, are not linear across the spectrum, so there needs to be a correction uh, for uh, the, the non-linearity. Uh, some sensors, you know, will see violet as, uh, as not as bright as blue and will assign uh, a much lower intensity to that violet than, than actual. Uh, so correcting for that non-linearity when using a, a non-linear sensor is, 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 is very critical. Um, but again, it's, uh, you know, what should the output be, uh, you know, um, and the most common ways to measure it is their dental radiometer. And this was really where, you know, we try to, as blue light analytics, to, to, to help here. You know, can we, you know, help with, uh, you know, light measurement in dental practices? And so we'll talk a little, little, bit, more, uh, a little bit more about that. So, well, first of all, for those that may or may not know, uh, you know, especially, uh, you know, in the U.S., but in many countries now around the world, uh, you know, clinicians can ring up their, uh, their, their 3M sales rep and, and request a free uh, light evaluation. So that was one thing that we worked on was, you know, uh, how can we bring light testing to, to dental offices? And, you know, when we started, a lot of people were kind of apprehensive. Well, why do I need to measure my light? Uh, you know, it's working. Blue light's coming out of it. Um, you know, it just wasn't something a lot of people were, were accustomed to, especially when LED lights came out, you know, they were thought to, well, they're not going to degrade, uh, you know, they don't generate a lot of heat. They're going to last for, you know, 10,000 runtime hours, but of course not every LED is, is equivalent either. Uh, and every light source over time can degrade and, and other maintenance, uh, you know, issues, uh, can, can arise and, and infection control barriers, they can all affect the light output. Uh, so we were really pleased to be able to work with, uh, you know, a manufacturer partner the, to get the service provided. Um, you know, they can't provide it to you every week. Uh, you know, it's not uh, a frequency uh, that they can, can, can help you out with, uh, but certainly as a one-time kind of check, uh, they have they've helped find a lot of problem lights uh, out in the market. And we've, we've, we've collected a lot of data from that, which is, again, helping us understand how these lights perform. Um, and then, of course, we built a, a, a device called Checkup. And so checkup is a lower cost, uh, you know, device for measuring lights uh, in, in their practice, you know, measuring them, you know, whether it's every week or every day or before every use as, as, as frequent as they want. And not only that, what we've tried to do is to bring some context to the, the irradiance measurement. Uh, you know, if someone sees 1350, well, what do they do? Uh, really, you need to take that to your instructions for use and figure out how long you need to cure for. So what we've tried to do is build that into the application to interpret instructions for use for you, or at least to help you do that, so that you then know, uh, you know, what at least minimum curing time uh, to, 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 to reach for. So that's where we tried to bring uh, some context to, uh, to that via our, our, our checkup. And so it, it, is a, it is a radiometer, checkup is a radiometer, but, you know, how is it different than other radiometers uh, on the market? And so, you know, a lot of radiometers are, are, are typical photodiode technology, some of them, you know, quite small, so they can't capture all of the light. Uh, although I know there's uh, at least one other one out there that has a, a larger, a much larger array to collect the light, which is really important. Um, you know, uh, that nonlinearity, so making sure you're correcting whether you're using a special, you know, filter to correct that nonlinearity, uh, or whether I'll talk a little bit about how we, uh, we uh, do that correction. You know, truly, you know, if you have a smaller sensor and non-linear, nothing is, 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 is corrected, you know, you can likely take that, that, that uh, radiometer and calibrate it to a light source using a secondary, probably laboratory uh, integrated sphere or thermopile to confirm what the actual right number is and then calibrating that meter to measure that light accurately. But if you grab another light that has a different spectrum or different tip size, you know, really, these are some of the variables that can cause some uh, dental radiometers to be off by a, a significant degree. Uh, you know, also, uh, you know, basically some of these meters provide a, a maximum reading. So if you're using a pulse mode or a ramp mode, uh, it's not quantifying the energy that's being delivered, you know, through that entire cycle. So again, uh, you know, uh, it's very important if uh, you're measuring some of these different modes. A, a standard mode should... Uh, should be reasonably uh, consistent, 
Um, but uh, yeah, so again, and again, a lot of these meters provide only at one, you know, one single radiance number, which requires some uh, interpretation via your materials uh, instruction for you. So, you know, with checkup, you know, we've, we've made a device that interfaces with, uh, you know, mobile device. So we have now some software that we can do some interesting things with, you know, we can build in a database of lights and materials. Uh, you know, we have a, a, a 28 by 28 millimeter array sensor. So we're capturing all of the light, uh, you know, being received by the sensor, obviously through a, a stack of filters. So we get a good signal to noise without saturation. Um, we really train the sensor off of our spectrometer measurements. Uh, so that's how we're able to get really good accuracy. Of course, you've got to input the correct light. Uh, if you are testing one light and, and putting it under another light, uh, it's not going to work. So, uh, you know, we're able to correct the nonlinearity of the sensor by feeding it spectral data uh, from the curing light. Uh, so if a curing light has a spe specific spectrum, we then run that through that correction factor, uh, which is then able to uh, provide uh, quite an accurate measurement across the, the spectrum of uh, spectra of curing lights, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, and then also we measure in real time. So the whole curing cycle uh, is measured so that we can, uh, you know, properly estimate the amount of total energy, uh, you know, coming out of the light uh, during that cycle uh, in that particular mode. Um, you know, absolutely accounting for the active area diameter of the tips. We, uh, you know, we, we don't just use a 10 millimeter guide. We actually deduce the active area of the fiber optic bundles or the lens. Uh, to get a good uh, account of the area we're dividing the power uh, into. And, uh, and then, of course, it calculates the average of values for the complete uh, curing cycle, uh, provides curing times for materials, and, of course, in the application that has uh, the instructions for use, if available from the manufacturer, we have them in there, so you can always go back and kind of check. So that's a little bit about checkup, just kind of, you know, talk a little bit about that. We're really proud of it. We feel that you know, we put a lot of years of, of research and education to try to develop a tool to help clinicians, uh, you know, manage uh, manage their light curing and these, uh, you know, complexities, uh, you know, between the the, the, the light outputs and, and the material requirements. So now we'll switch gears a little bit and kind of look at some data uh, collected in the field. And so uh, basically here we have uh, measurements from, you know, one particular model of light uh, so we have the light output in, in, in milliwatts per centimeter squared and, and simply the number of lights, uh, you know, almost 1,500, maybe 13, 13 1,400 uh, examples of measurements taken from, from the field. Uh, this was using our, our checkmark spectrometer uh, unit. And so what we see is this light was on the market for at least 10 years. So there's a range and ages of these measurements. Um, and what we can see here is that you know, we see measurements ranging from, you know, probably 50 milliwatts per, per centimeter squared, you know, all the way up to over 2,500. And so what's really interesting, especially this being, a, a, you know, what we would call a lower quality light simply because of the spread of data, is that you really don't know what you get. You know, the light new out of the box is, is saying that it should be 1,100, um, but in some cases producing over 2,000. So again, if you assumed 1,100 and, and we're using a longer curing time, that, uh, that heat concern uh, becomes more of a concern. Of course, as time goes on, you know, the, the degradation of the light or, you know, different maintenance issues, degradation of the light guide, uh, infection control barriers, uh, you know, material on the tips, uh, you know, can certainly change the output. So really, after looking at this data set, we can see that only 40% of the lights remain within a plus or minus 20%. Uh, so, you know, if you're, you're assuming that, you know, your, your manufacturer stayed at 1100 plus or minus 20%, you know, only 40% of those lights fit that bill. So really need to know uh, if your light is outside of that range that you can compensate one way, you know, one way or the other, either reducing curing time or increasing uh, curing time or, you know, simply replacing the light. Now here's a, a moderate, uh, a moderate, um, a moderate quality, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll say is, we see the, the pack of data is a little bit tighter now, and, and we can see by the 63%, same thing, this light on the market for, for over 10 years. Uh, uh, these examples, I have three examples here. A lot of them, uh, lights came out at the same time to kind of get a relative spread of their data over, over the years of use. Uh, so this model, again, came in you know much higher, uh, brand new. Uh, this light kind of came in at 1,600, 1,700. 
uh, and then of course over time uh, loses some of that output to to reach uh, its its manufacturer stated in the area of 1150. Um, so again, you know that 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 loss in intensity for different reasons over time. Uh, you know this unit still had 63% of their lights within that plus or minus 20%, which is uh, which is pretty good. Um, and then we see here, uh, you know, a higher quality uh, light, you know, via or explained by this data. You know, uh, the manufacturer uh, states that, you know, 1200 milliwatts per centimeter squared. Interesting, there are still always some of these manufacturing kind of outliers, uh, manufacturing defects, maybe, where every once in a while you get something that's, uh, you know, not what it should be. I mean, it happens in everything manufactured, but for the most part, you can see, this light is very much starting out where, where it needs to be. Uh, and then of course, over time, uh, you know, it does lose intensity, um, but 85% of the lights remain uh, in spec. And this is well after 10 years. Uh, so again, uh, quality does make a difference and, and certainly, uh, you know, value in the long run, uh, you know, as much as this light might've been more expensive as the other examples, it's likely paid for itself uh, by the years of, of consistent quality use. So these are some of the other things there that uh, start to to impact that uh, that light uh, light measurements of debris on the tip fractures. Again, this stuff absolutely needs to be uh, resolved uh, between patients. Uh, certainly, with uh, with COVID and infection control barriers becoming more popular, there's no reason for material to be stuck on the tips. You know, barriers should be used uh, pretty much every time. I mean, autoclaving tips uh, tends to be hard on them as well too. Uh, damage really should be uh, should be replaced. Uh, certainly, fractured glass, uh, missing tips. Here we have a plastic tip that that, that went missing. Uh, and some of these lights, we still see them being used without these issues being addressed. Uh, you know, we're working on uh, some of this data we have collected uh, with Dr. Price and then Dr. Farrakhan to 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 publish some of this up. Of course, with Franklin and myself as well too. Um, to kind of show, okay, well, what is this behavior around taking care of lights, light maintenance? Um, you know, this is stuff really that that's important uh, needs to be needs to be resolved. So again, I talked about barriers. Uh, you know, in, in today's age, especially with a lot of lights having uh, you know some of these cracks or crevices where you know contaminants can be trapped, uh, even though you're wiping them down. Uh, I mean, if you have a full glass tip, uh, certainly uh, you can. Uh, uh, you know, you can uh, put that in the autoclaver, um, but, you know, is that going in the autoclaver between every patient? Not likely. Uh, so again, using, uh, using barriers, it's, it's, it's just, uh, you know, it, it should just be used every time, independent of what light being used. But placing that barrier properly is important. Uh, not using opaque barriers, uh, absolutely important. Um, uh, we have uh, an IADR uh, presentation on the effect on, of barriers as a function of distance. So not only uh, can, it, can it affect the output at zero, it can also affect that output and the optics over distance, especially if it's hitting that seam and redirecting the light or scattering it. Uh, you really want to make sure you have that barrier fit uh, nice and flush and, 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 and proper, and that will absolutely minimize the effect. Uh, of the barrier on the light output and, and the light output's optics over clinically relevant distances. So, uh, you know, a bit of a, a shift in gears again here too, to talk a little bit more about materials. Uh, you know, big shift uh, happened uh, absolutely, uh, you know, with uh, composite from, from amalgams to composites. Uh, composites have truly taken over really even for posterior load bearing locations, which, uh, you know, it took some time for some composites to really build up those characteristics to handle those uh, uh, situations. But I, I believe the materials that exist today are, are quite amazing uh, and certainly can do that. So uh, amalgam uh, is, is really uh, phasing out for, for obvious reasons. Uh, you know, the conser con conservative nature, the flexibility, and obviously the, the aesthetics there. And it's much cheaper than, of course, uh, you know, other uh, indirect restorations or tooth colored materials, uh, ceramics. Uh, so it's a, it's a great material, but you know, there are some steps that are a little more uh, involved in just placing an amalgam. So again, that, that uh, the, the cutting of the prep, the bonding of the prep, uh, you know, uh, whether you need to uh, acid etch it, uh, you know, some of the different techniques, uh, of course, the light curing uh, of that and the finishing. So there's a lot more steps, uh, certainly. And, and a lot more steps where things can go wrong. And, and here we see light curing plays a role in, in, in certainly two products there, uh, the bonding agent and the composite. And, 
And so certainly, you know, looking at, uh, you know, the number of class two restorations out there, it, it, they do make up a pretty big chunk of restorations and, and they do represent a challenge. So again, uh, making sure uh, you're well equipped to meet those challenges is, is certainly uh, Im important. So this last kind of section we're going to focus on, uh, you know, just, you know, how long, you know, does a composite last? And uh, so trying to kind of look through uh, studies, you know, clinical studies, uh, you know, uh, uh, retrospective studies, uh, you know, we, we, we kind of want to know uh, how long should a restoration last, a composite restoration last? Can it last as long as an amalgam restoration? Uh, I think there are a number of studies that, that you know, well-controlled studies, really good, uh, you know, uh, practitioners who knew they were part of a study, you know, I believe probably did everything uh, they could using good equipment, using good materials, you know, certainly were able to show uh, uh, an annual failure rate of, of between one and three percent, and uh, which is exceptional, which is exceptional considering all of all of the 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 complexities, uh, the patient characteristics, the lights, the materials, the the technique, um, you know. So what was really good is some of these really well done clinical studies showed the kind of success that can be had. Um, as we looked at uh, some other studies. Um, and this being trying to look at more clinical data from, from general practices that may or may not have known that their data was going to be analyzed. So I think this uh, UK study uh, uh, by uh, uh, um, uh, Burke and Lucarati were, were looked at, you know, a lot of restorations and started to show that, you know, the data produced by a clinical study that was really controlled versus the average data coming from general practices, there is a bit of a disconnect there. So here, you know, again, this is a little, little further, this is quite a while ago, I think from the 1990s to maybe 2011, um, you know, they had a 14% annual failure rate, uh, you know, for composite uh, restorations overall, uh, molar composites, so posterior restorations, uh, and cited as one of the, the, the major failures, of course, is always secondary caries and, and restoration fracture. Um, but they did comment that the, uh, the, the operator had a big, uh, had a big uh, impact. And just kind of looking at a more recent paper done by uh, Lasky and Updam, uh, and some others here uh, too, to give you know, everybody credit, uh, this is a really good one. It came out uh, in 2019, and uh, you know they did a, a study there in Holland uh, where uh, they looked at 31,000 restorations. Um, they had a good range of users. They didn't know they were part of a study, um, and what they found uh, for their uh, you know uh, especially class two restorations um, that there was a huge variation in annual failure rates based on the operator. And that range was 3.6% to 11.4%. Uh, so again, pretty, pretty big, uh, pretty big range there. And then, you know, going on after some of the other, you know, uh, studies that were really well done, showing that uh, a one to 3% success rate is, is possible. So again, it's, you know, what are the, what are the contributing factors to these? Uh, certainly there's, there's patient uh, characteristics, there's material implications, there's technique implications. And so, you know, really at Blue Light, you know, our, our overall goal uh, is to help, uh, you know, clinicians reach that, you know, that one to 3% annual failure rate with their composite restorations. And so, you know, this is where we're looking to develop, uh, you know, technologies to work with manufacturers, to work with researchers, uh, you know, to figure out how to translate that, you know, the, the knowledge we have, we learn and research, and to really bridge that gap with, uh, you know, everyday clinical practice uh, by helping provide, you know, products and services uh, uh, to the to the offices to really help them uh, manage that. So with that, I know I've, I've taken up a fair bit of time, uh, but uh, I, I can certainly open the floor now to, to questions, uh, comments. Uh, 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 yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, my God. Did that let me just unmute myself? Let me. Unmute. Yeah, now I'm good here back thank you so much chris this is an amazing presentation i was here just shaking on the on the chair with all the information it was like unbelievable so thank you so much for for coming and sharing this knowledge with us so i have some questions here actually personally i have probably 20 questions that's <laughs> that's my time but i hear i have the questions on the chat and uh on the youtube channel as well so 
one question is uh, from Marcel is for the checkup, how does it work? So you have to have a, a, a annual subscription, how does it work and how he can have this in clinical practice? Very, very good question. Uh, you know, uh, with the subscription model, you know, with our databases, we're constantly updating lights and materials and providing feedback. Uh, and this is, you know, again, we started off in this area of, of pairing up that subscription. Um, there are there are ways that we can work around that uh, subscription. We're working on trying to uh, decouple that so that you know it doesn't kind of scare people away to say, okay, well, you know, I got to buy this and then I got to keep paying. Uh, so we are working on a way to, to, to bridge that so that you can have the experience with the unit, see how it works, um, and then, you know, see what the value is in the subscription. So I think as we, you know, as you launch a product, you see what the market tells you, um, you know, we've, we've got some really good feedback. And one of them is, you know, well, people are a little apprehensive to pay a subscription model right out of the gate. So uh, we're working on ways to, to, to bridge that. So whether they can have a, an introductory period uh, where there's no subscription so they can start using the device, uh, whether we kind of carve it off so that the subscription is an opt-in. Uh, so we're working on lots of different models to do that. So if there truly is uh, you know, interest in, in, in acquiring uh, you know, the checkup technology, just reach out to us and we can certainly go through, um, go through the options and, and, and possibilities there. Uh, as as it is uh, you know a new product and it will continue to evolve. We're building lots of great things uh, into the application, and of course we're looking for feedback uh, on that as well too. So uh, yeah, don't be afraid of uh, of, of the subscription. Uh, that's something we can we can talk through and work through with anyone uh, who's interested. Awesome, Diane. I think uh, you have some questions on your chat. Yeah, so I put in the chat because uh, I got it as a private message, but I think better Chris answered that one. So the question is, um, I'm sorry, just a second. With the offset, uh, off radiometers, what are the options for the practitioners? And uh, longer turn times is counterproductive uh, in clinics. So what is the expected life expectancy for curing lights? Can lights be repaired to give proper light? Those are the three questions she asked. Okay, uh, I'll try to address them uh, as, as I remember uh, them. Um, so as, as we mentioned, uh, you know, the quality of the light that you buy is, is important on, on that longevity. Um, you know, but even a quality light can reduce its output over time. Uh, it's just important that you know how that's changing. And so, you know, a lot of the lights, they, they won't give much more of a manufacturer warranty than, you know, two, maybe a couple to three uh, years. But a, a good quality light, uh, like some of the, the top quality on the market, I mean, we've seen some of them 10 years in the market uh, and producing the same, the same output. Uh, of course, taking care of them is a big, is a big uh, a part of that, uh, really important. And, uh, you know, so again, in that compensation, so as the power of your light goes down, Eventually, at some point, you may need to increase your curing time, uh, but it also depends on the material that you're using. So, you know, some materials require a longer curing time because of their chemistries, uh, maybe because of their age and their instructions for use is just saying, you know, 20 or 40 seconds. Uh, so maybe moving to a different material that that has a maybe a faster initiation system. Um, you know, there are, are companies that produce these. So there really is a, a, a trade and balance between the light and the material. Um, but you got to make sure to, to stay away from the extremes until, you know, they've been validated. So again, some lights claiming to cure in one or three seconds with any material, you know, but now if you have some systems that are pairing up because of their output, their, their, their chemistry, uh, that they can do this. And so really, it's, it's really important uh, to know what material you're using. And if you want to change that material, uh, you know, to reduce your curing time, that, that's also uh, possible as well. Uh, Diane, my, my memory is not overly great. Uh, I, I think I might have missed a question or two. Uh, she just wanted to know the options of radiometers that we have in the market. And um, if the, and I think I, you kind of answered, yes, the light currents can be repaired. So if you're actually measuring over time, you know if that's good or not, conditions, so you actually have to go and look for the manufacturer 
or, you know, like to get a check and everything. But I think, as you said, like good curing lights, you don't have that many times consulting the manufacturer for repair. They usually last very long time. So it's really a balance of how much you want to pay for your curing lights since the beginning and how much you're going to be paying over repair over the years. We do have that problem here with um, the curing lights that we have in clinics, which are different from preclinics. In clinics, we never change them. They're amazing. Uh, but in preclinics, eventually, we, we measure them every semester. And every semester, I have like a few, at least six from 90, you know, to go uh, get repair. So that, that's also a cost that you have. But I think the only thing we didn't answer was what kind of radiometers they kind of have as an option in their um, private practice. Yeah, absolutely. And so again, we make a radiometer, but you know, the next company uh, that has a, a, a very good performing radiometer is Ivoclar in the blue phase two meter. Uh, it does have a larger sensor. It, it does have some, some good uh, things built into it. Um, but of course, there are some lights that don't measure as, as, well, uh, as well on it. So if you're looking for a meter to measure any light, now, if you have Ivoclar lights and you have an Ivoclar material, uh, or Ivoclar lights and an Ivoclar meter, um, you know, you're, you're going to be fine. Uh, you know, uh, one of the other meters that was out there, I'm not sure if they still make it, the, the Kerr LE Demetron meter, it's a blue one. Uh, that's one that we've tested as well, too. And again, it, it has a smaller diode. It has, uh, you know, a, a defined aperture. Uh, it's analog, um, but within reason, with a lot of lights, it, it, it tended to me measure reasonably well. So those would be the two that I've come across that are, are reasonably well. And so where we've tried to obviously Im improve on top of that is, is then building in, uh, you know, the lights, the materials to be able to measure any light on the market. So you don't have to worry about when you buy your next light is, you know, is my radiometer going to measure it? But out of all the meters, and I've seen lots of other meters out there, I really wouldn't use too many others. Uh, we've seen some others just to be, be quite a bit off. Uh, so those were the next two uh, other than ours uh, that I think would be absolutely a, a, a benefit to, to anybody's office. Awesome. Dr. Richard Price has a question. Please, Dr. Richard Price, go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. So um, I sent to everybody a link to the FDA site, uh, the 510K site. And I must admit, uh, this is a bit of a sort of personal uh, vendetta I have, should we say, against the FDA, <laughs> <laughs> in that um, you've got companies such as Blue Light and, you know, my research and all of our research. You know, we're all telling the, the dentist to go and buy good curing light. And the dentist says to us, okay, well, I'll go and buy this light, and it's uh, approved for use. And first of all, the, the FDA actually doesn't really approve anything for you, so it just grants a 510K license or whatever. But uh, it's very hard for the dentist to find out which lights are approved. And I see uh, Chris sort of nodding his head because, <clears throat> you know, what we find is the dentist will go and buy, you know, a $50 curing light because it's got on the, um, on the website, you know, from Alibaba, CE or something else or FDA approved. And, you know, there's no way that you can go after the company for misrepresenting the lights because it's in China. So my big bugbear, and, you know, I would ask all the people listening to this presentation to each write a letter to the FDA <laughs> saying, <laughs> please, please make your website more user-friendly so the dentist can find out not only what curing lights are FDA, you know, approved, uh, in quotation marks, but also what composites, what implants, what disinfectants, everything else. It just is, it's so hard to find what is a good, you know, what is a curing light that's at least 510K. I don't know if anybody else has got a, a magic cure for it, but uh, I, I can't find the stuff very easily. It's tough. No, well, that's, that's my bug there. Yeah. So please that's write a letter to the FDA saying, please make your website more user-friendly so that uh, dentists can search and also patients can search as well. Because, I mean, let's face it, that's where we are right now. Patients, you know, come to us and they want to know if we're using FDA-approved materials. And, you know, companies, like I said, in China can just put FDA-approved on it. Uh, and there's just pretty much no way to disprove it. Thanks.
which is a great idea, write an editorial and have it signed by all material scientists. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll add it to the list. <laughs> I know it's, it's so it's so important, and I've I've done this list. I have printed out the list of lights that uh, in the U.S. Uh, a curing light is a class two medical device. Uh, they're required to submit under the light's name. Uh, so that's something that uh, I believe we are going to add to our software is whether the the light in its jurisdiction being used uh, has has approval. And so I mean that's something that we feel is is extremely. Uh, important. Uh, we hope that if we put that front and center, maybe clinicians will 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 think twice. Uh, here in Canada, it's it's actually a, a little more challenging because our Health Canada uh, classifies it as a Class One medical device. So the device doesn't need to be submitted, but the manufacturer needs to submit an application that they sell any product in Canada. So, you know, uh, if we wanted to go see if, uh, you know, let's say uh, the, the, the Velo uh, has been approved here in Canada, uh, we can't. And so I think, you know, on, on Health Canada's side, they're really uh, missing the boat here as well, because we have nothing here to, to even check. We can check, you know, the manufacturer, if the manufacturer is listed. Um, but in the U.S., at least it's classified as, as a class two, and you can get to that list. Um, cause it's, you know, it, it's something to be concerned about, uh, you know, from, especially from that liability standpoint. Yeah, it really is from a liability standpoint. And, and uh, <clears throat> Jean-Francois, you know this very well, I'm sure, that in Europe, um, with the changes in the medical devices there, um, all the companies that came into effect this year, the companies there have, have had to really up their, their game. And th there isn't a list yet. But I've been told by uh, Frank Pfefferkorn that uh, there will be one in time. But right now, uh, there isn't a list. And apparently, by the way, this all came about from um, silicone breast implants. Uh, you know, they were, they were not listed. People were putting industrial silicone in these things. So uh, that's where it kind of originated from. But uh, yeah, we, we really need to have some way of, of checking that the stuff that we're using is, uh, is OK. We really do. Um, I noticed that you know some of the composites that you're using, for example, are actually not you know intended for sale in North America. I mean, they're intended for sale in you know the Middle East or um, South America and such like, or curing lights, and you know they they have those. So when you're reading uh, papers, you know, I don't believe there's any difference in the composites. I think it's more a a sales thing, a marketing thing. It's the way they can price it. But uh, anyway, that's that's the other thing to kind of think about is that you go and buy a composite on online, and is actually not in, intended for sale in North America. So watch out for that. I see you know, Matthias nodding his head. I mean, that's that's a problem we have. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. I mean, if if you want, uh, Jean Francois, I'll be happy to to work with you and. Put together some something that we can send around to people um, because it really does apply to everything in dental materials that we're working on you know it's dental implants abutments ceramics the lot well the only thing we'll have then we'll have marketing as our enemy because they're never tired finding confusing names to to confuse the user to promote their product <laughs> That's, that's true. The other day, Dr. Roulet came to my room and said, Mateus, what is a nano composite ceramic and probably seven extra adjectives for them? I said, I have no clue. And then he said, this is a composite people are missing. He was like very sad with uh, what was written on the, on some papers. And recently that was uh, published in the dental materials. Uh, editorial from uh, Dr. Ba Brian Darville explaining exactly when you report science, uh, we tend to do something very badly <clears throat> that is saying we did following the manufacturer's recommendation. And this is not science. Science, you have to report every corner of what you perform. Otherwise, what you're saying is that, oh, go back and check with the manufacturer. Whatever they did, I did the same. And you're not reporting correctly. So that's something that I will share with everyone. I start to collect the email so uh, we can share materials uh, for, for starting now. Today was just the kickoff. 
of everything. And uh, this is a very interesting editorial when we're talking about what is science doing and what is manufacturing doing and how we can merge that together to, as uh, Chris said, to narrow this gap between science and clinic. What Mateo said was even more saddening. Someone was classifying Lava Ultimate as a ceramic. So I called the author and say, hey, how can you on earth put this in your paper? And the answer was, well, that was a request from the reviewers. And they insisted that we have to use the classification which is given by the manufacturer and the terms which is given by the manufacturer. And I think here, we from the science side should become active. And I'm working on that. That's incredible. Very good. Anyone else questions? Go ahead and mute yourself. No, I have one question to Chris and, and, and Dr. Price as well. So I start studying curing lights because of your work. That's the, when I was in the second year of dental school, Dr. Ivo Correa, he just introduced to the papers and then I got interest to that. So I have two questions. Uh, one is regarding what do you see as a trend on curing lights? Because what I've learned is that we start with the halogen, LED, uh, halogen lights, and then all of a sudden the halogen lights were very bad, and then they start to get a very good uh, to the point that we reach the Optilux 501, and then we start to have decent composite with that curing light. And then after this, we enter the generation of LEDs, and it was a nightmare in the beginning. And with your science, basically, now we have sort of a gold standard curing light that we can tell the dentist safely, yes, buy this one because this has all these characteristics that we are looking for. But now, there are these manufacturers that are coming with laser lights. And what I see as a trend is that we're going to face this bumpy road all over again. So... Please go, go over that and tell me what is your perspective on that uh, topic. Uh, Richard, please go ahead. Uh, well, I'll let you go first, Chris. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there, Matthias, is that, you know, when you have some of these big shifts uh, and, and, and laser-like hearing, it really is a big shift. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean that, 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 the shift might not be a good thing, but that initial bumpy road to begin with to figure out, okay, well, how do we adapt this new technology? You know, it's, it's the light, which is then paired with all the materials. Um, you know, uh, I think there's a number of us that have uh, some of these laser lights and we're, we're looking at it. it. It delivers an enormous amount of energy in a very short time. Uh, you know, it can, it can likely deliver so much energy that it, it compensates for the, the inefficiency uh, of, of that, uh, you know, and uh, but the amount of heat this thing generates uh, is 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 quite uh, is is quite uh, is quite a bit. So, you know, um, where halogen lights again, you go back to that intensity. You couldn't really do a lot of uh, of damage with it. The LEDs pushed it to the point where you can. LEDs are going to push it, you know, far and beyond. So, you know, I get concerned when. You know the light curing task is 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 assigned to to an assistant who potentially never had any light curing training. Uh, I think with the laser light, if you had really good training, you treated it like a scalpel. Uh, you know, it's likely it could be very very effective, but we don't know. So I would never uh, endorse it until we've we've run it through the the paces. Um, the intensity of this light is what it is. Maybe there's a different intensity. Um, the mitigation of, of the optics or, or, or the, 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 vi the visible light from an LED losing that intensity over distance, the fact that the laser can maintain that intensity uh, over uh, clinical distance and more, is, 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 it really solves a, a, a big problem, uh, you know, of, of you know, wondering you know, how much intensity you're delivering in these different cases where the light's at different uh, positions. Uh, so it has tremendous potential, but it's also terrifying uh, at the same time. So maybe, you know, I agree, uh, you know, I would not recommend to adopt it right away uh, until we kind of know, uh, or if you're an early adopter that is looking to, 
uh, you know, really work with the manufacturer, figure out how to do this safely, effectively, efficiently, uh, test it on materials. Uh, you know, it, it's likely laser curing, you know, will, will, will take over. Uh, and, and it's only a matter of time and, and that, that, that bumpy road to get there. <laughs> Okay, Chris, so my, my comment, <clears throat> I think maybe is directed a little bit more to answering the, the question like as to where we're going. I think we're going to go to what the, what the dentists want, which is fast cure. So the dentists want to cure things in three seconds. They would like to do it in one second if they could. So I think that's where we're going. As Chris kind of touched on, um, Unfortunately, you know, if you miss the target for one second in a three-second exposure, that's 33% less energy. And if you miss it for one second in a one-second exposure, you're screwed. So, uh, you know, you've got to have really good technique when you're using uh, any kind of laser curing light. Now, if any of you have had a look on the um, AMD Monet website, you'll see that uh, there's my ugly face on that. And there's also some beam profile stuff. And if you look at the beam profile stuff, you'll see that, uh, yeah, it is certainly a laser. <laughs> There's no question about it. Um, and if you, any of you have got one of these uh, curing lights, you, you'll know very quickly that you can shine the thing across the room and it'll still cure the composite. So um, the, the beam profile images that we've got there show that uh, it is a laser. It does have a smaller spot size than they are, than they are suggesting. Uh, in the instructions or on the website. Um, it's very, very high rated in the center. And certainly I would agree with Chris, you know, we're kind of, we're not too sure yet what it does with temperature. Um, if you want to do a kind of quick and dirty test on it, uh, just get your glasses and shine it on your glasses. And now the glasses are intended to block out or absorb um, the blue light. So, you know, in a way, it's a bit of an unfair test, but it's also very similar to your eyes. So uh, my advice would be, you know, just, just shine that thing on your, your glasses, not right in the center where you might want to use them, because I think you'll find they'll melt them. <laughs> <laughs> so I usually do it on the shield, you know, bits on the side to show that. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's new technology. I agree with Chris. I think it's kind of developing, evolving at this stage. But uh, it's certainly addressing what the dentists want, which is fast curing. And let's face it, I mean, we're seeing that with uh, all the new curing lights that are coming out now. They've all got a fast curing mode in them. And companies such as 3M are going to have to say, watch out, because uh, they haven't. <laughs> you know, they're, they're sticking very much to the, the 10 or 20 second cure, and uh, they, they're just not staying with the times. Um, maybe COVID has. Uh, crimp their research budgets, I kind of don't know, or maybe they just decided that fast curing is not a good idea. Um, I think the, the research is still very much uh, wanting in that area. And uh, for those of you that are researchers that are listening in, I would really encourage you to look at that, uh, fast curing. I think that's a really good area uh, for research right now, looking at different composites, looking at different conditions and fast curing and what works and what doesn't work. Well, I fully agree with that, that we'll go for fast curing, but I also fully agree that if we miss the target, we have a big problem. And I'm, I'm using an, an analogy I hate to use, but no one shoots like in the Wild West from the hip, right? The, the good shooter uses an aiming device. So he is or she is con co uh, convinced that she or he will hit the target. So my idea was many years ago that if you go for very fast curing, you should have a camera that shows where you, lane, you hit with the light. And since we have an LED screen or LCD or whatever screen on a good curing light, we could show the dentist whether he hits his target the moment he triggers the, uh, releases the trigger. And then we would improve the quality of light curing, I'm sure. Cool. Yeah, well, as you know, we've got we've got the polyvision, you know, in the in the blue face lights. And so they, they've attempted to do that. It doesn't tell you if you're on the right tooth, but it does tell you if you, at least if you're on a tooth. <laughs> so that's kind of good. Um, but uh, I know. I, go on. Somebody was going to say something. 
I just say I know that. That's a progress, but it could be even better. Yeah. But, uh, you know, something that you... I'm not divulging any secrets here, but it's something, again, you know, for the researchers here to, to look at. Um, it says it in the instructions for use. Uh, polyvision doesn't work when you put a plastic barrier on the end. Oh. <laughs> and it, it clearly states, states that in the uh, Ivoclar IFUs, but uh, I guess they're just expecting people are going to uh, autoclave the light guides. So, anyway, just an FYI, that's something to look at. You know? Mm -hmm. Okay. But yeah, I mean, a camera would be great, but then uh, Jean-Francois, we won't have a, a $50 curing light then, will we? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Of course, but anyway, you should buy those, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for the input. It's like an amazing, amazing having all these opinions coming on. And uh, so anyone else has more questions, want to comment, want to say anything? No? Well, well certainly, uh, Matthias, I want to, want to thank you for, for, you know, creating this uh, initiative. Uh, it's very enjoyable to, you know, to have uh, not just a presentation, but uh, a good chat and conversation, uh, you know, with uh, those of us that uh, think about this all day long. And so thank you so much for, for organizing this. It, yeah, it, Mateus, great premiere and keep going. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you so much to you to to uh, to stay here and joining this project. I think when I start uh, searching and researching about curing lights, uh, I I I know that I always try to to get to the those people there the trend topics. And I remember Dr. Marcelo Giannini, he he always do that. He always bring the professor from all over the world to our school in Piracicaba that I graduate. And then that was the times that I start to learn more. So I said, why not bringing this and try to collaborate more? And then I have great news because Dr. Ole, I think we have two uh, people that are going to come to for the next meeting. Would you like to announce? We don't have the dates yet. Should I do that? Yeah, well, you can announce. Okay, I asked Mutlu Özkan and I asked Uwe Blunk and they both agreed to come uh, and they will talk of their thing, their care most. So that will be for sure very interesting. Yeah, and the idea is to expand a little bit beyond the UFCD. So if you have any students, Dr. Price or uh, Dr. Signoretti, so bring you here. Everyone, Christian, I see you here. If you have a student, I will send out the topics that we're going to talk. So the next topic is going to be margin analysis. So bringing back the dawn of margin analysis. And the other one is going to be digital dentistry. So these are the two next topics. So if you have a student or a postdoc or an junior faculty that has a great uh, uh, talent on that topic, please just reach me out. We're going to set up the presentation. And the idea is to spread this uh, as much as we can. Sounds good. Very good. So thank you so much, Sarah. Brilliant presentation. Thank you so much, Chris. You are amazing. We keep in touch. We have many things going on. So I'm very excited for that. And thank you, my partners here, Dr. Lee, Dr. Oliveira, uh, that is always supporting this, uh, uh, this initiative and all of the people that were here. Okay. So stay safe, everyone that is in Gainesville, and see you guys soon. That's great. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.